gentlemen, I'm Dr. Mike Cromer, president of the Hillsborough County Medical Association. Welcome back to session two of our uh, Retirement Planning for Physicians webinar. And again, this is sponsored by Jensen Anderson Wealth Management Group. And uh, we have with us tonight, Mike Jensen. Welcome, Mike. Good evening. And Jeff Anderson. Welcome, Jeff. Welcome. Thank you. Well, Probably everyone uh, in attendance tonight was part of our seminar last week and uh, for session one. And we have a um, informational packed session tonight also. Um, I did want to say that um, everybody who signed up for these sessions, um, uh, Mike and Jeff said they're going to uh, make available a free um, financial plan uh, tailored specifically to you and your um, um, situation. I'm gonna let them talk more about that in just a minute, but uh, it is a item that is usually, um, I think you guys said around $1,500, is that right? That they offer- $1,500, we give it to HCMA for 500. And for the people that are on this, uh, after speaking with HCMA, we're just gonna waive the fee. So uh, little did we know how much uh, we'd get out of this uh, two two week session, but that's certainly something I'm going to look forward to. Thank you, Mike and and Jeff, very much for your graciousness. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we have uh, um, oh, some more people are coming on. Um, I just as as more people are coming on, let me just remind everybody that uh, down at the bottom are the icons. Um, you got to sometimes move your cursor a little bit for it to light up and press on the chat icon. And at, during each session, each part of tonight's session, if you have any questions related. I just lost his uh, sound. You're muted. Just lost everything. You, oh, you're back on. Am I back? Yes, I you're back. You. You're back. Oh, okay. You. Um, and I will, um, format the questions at the end of each session and, um, and present them to the presenters. So Mike and Jeff, I think everybody who's going to be with us may be signed on now, so I'll turn the evening over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to just do a little housekeeping real quick because we're, we're starting out of order. So just to get everybody up to speed, we are starting in session one, um, section four. Uh, in the sessions, each chapter is, is exclusive of each other. So um, we're if you're following along in the book, uh, this is the first book, session one, section four. We'll be covering um, section four, retirement income sources. We'll be covering section five, uh, distributions. Then we'll cover social security. Then we'll cover risk management. And then we'll be wrapping up with investments. Okay. Mike? And another thing I, I want to say uh, just as we said last week, when we run these conferences, uh, especially with physicians, we use a conversation method. You will see Jeff and I talk back and forth with each other as we hit each topic. And we, were, we ask you uh, to please don't hesitate to ask us questions during the session, which we'll cover at the breaks. But true learning comes from the, the questioning and the answering. Um, so please don't hesitate to uh, ask any question. That makes this more enjoyable for all involved. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, we're going to lead off with uh, IRAs. Mike? <clears throat> IRAs. Um, they're so basic. We all know that. They're tax-favored savings uh, investment plans designed for retirement. Okay? The limits right now are $6,000 a piece. Um, if you're over 50, it's 7,000 a year. A uh, household gets $12,000. If, the, if there's two spouses then it's, uh, and they're over 50, it goes to uh, 14,000 a year. Very, very basic. What you're doing is you're putting in dollars into an account. The dollars are going to be a tax deduction for you on your, on your current income tax return. The, the dollars, once they're in there, are uh, growing tax deferred and uh, especially physicians one of the most important things is the assets that you have in 
those IRAs are uh, they're asset protected. If somebody sues you, they can't get to them. They're very basic they're, uh, and they're needed. And it's probably uh, next to your 401ks at, at work, that's something that you will use a lot. Jeff? Yeah, so let's talk about on whether or not we can, let's start off with traditional IRA. Right. Whether we can deduct those contributions or not. That's the first step. Um, and there's some rules here. Um, and there's a phase out and what that's called. I'm going to jump to this slide here. So what this says is that if you're married filing jointly and you make income married filing jointly less than 104,000 combined, you can always deduct your contribution. Um, if you're over 124, you cannot deduct the contribution. If you're between 104 to 124, uh, there's a phase out. And for single filer, it's below 65,000. Uh, you can deduct. In between 65 and 75, it's a phase out, and over 75, uh, no deduction. Now, there is a little bit of a difference here as far as if you are covered by a plan at work or not. So let's say I'm single and I have no 401k at work or 403b, I can always deduct my contributions to a traditional IRA. If I have a plan at work, um, I have to go by the income test. All right, now, if I'm covered, if this says if you're not covered by a plan at work and your filing status is um, married filing jointly um, and your spouse is not covered by a plan at work, which means both of you are not covered by a plan at work, you can both contribute. If one spouse is, is covered and the other one is not, then the income limit's a little bit higher. You've got 196, under 196, you can do a full deduction. Um, over 206, you cannot. All right, so plan at work plays a big role in whether or not you can deduct your traditional IRA. That money goes in, let's say I can deduct it. Let's say I made $100,000 and I'm, I make a deduction. That $7,000 or $6,000 deduct uh, contribution, I get to deduct. That money goes inside my IRA account. I can invest it however I want. I can buy stocks, I can buy mutual funds, I can buy bonds, I can buy real estate. That money is invested and it grows tax deferred. So let's say over my lifetime, I put in half a million dollars and at 59 and a half, it's now worth a million. Every dollar coming out of that account will be taxed as ordinary income. If I take it out prior to 59 and a half, there'll be an additional 10% added to my ordinary income, my effective rate, and that's how much tax I would pay. So I get a deduction on the front with the traditional IRA, okay, gross tax deferred, everything on the way out is taxable to me. And in fact, at age 72, you have to start taking money out of your IRAs due to the form of what's called a required minimum distribution, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. Okay, so that's traditional in a nutshell. Next right. up is Roth. Remember, we love Roth, the word Roth, we love it. Roth love IRAs it. are great. Uh, now for Roth IRA, if you look here, there's no plan at work qualification. It's purely income test only. So married filing jointly, less than 196. I can do a full deduction from me and my spouse to, uh, to, a, to a Roth IRA. In between 196 and 206 is a phase out over 206, no, deduct, no contribution to a Roth IRA. As a single filer, 124 and 139 are the numbers. Okay, so I'm going to be under 124,000. So let's assume that I, I qualify and I can do it. I don't get a deduction like I get in the traditional IRA. My contribution limits are the same though. Um, I can do $6,000, $7,000 slide here somewhere. Oops, let me get it there. The contribution limits are the same, 6,000, 7,000 if you're over age 50, do the catch up provision. In that example I used where I put $500,000 in over my lifetime, it's worth a million dollars now at 59 and a half. The big difference in the Roth, all that million dollars comes to me tax free. So that means if I've got a long time horizon or a long time before I'm going to access these funds, which really everybody does, even if you're 60 years old, you still got a long time ahead of you. So if you can contribute to a Roth, we love it because all of that growth is income tax free, which is a big deal. Um, it's also not a bad asset to leave to your estate because they're gonna get that money and it's all tax free to them too. So that's a pretty, pretty nice feature to have from a, from a estate planning perspective. It's always nice to have a bucket of money that you can tap into 
without having to pay tax on it down the road. Right. And the, the, the difference is you don't get to deduct the money. But in the major scheme of things, that tax deduction of that year um, may not mean as much. It will not mean as much as when you retire because of the tax deferred um, accumulation of wealth. The, it is a huge thing, huge thing that when you're retired and you start withdrawing, if you're paying taxes or not. So it, if there's a way, if you're 401k and, a lot, and most of those plans are 403b, will allow you to do a Roth in there also, try to do that. Uh, you may miss the tax deduction now. I don't think your CPA will mind uh, that much because it means that your most important time of your life income wise is when you're retired, none of that is taxed. Sorry for the interruption, Jeff. No problem, no problem, conversation. Um, so a lot of people say, well, Mike, Jeff, uh, I wanna make my traditional IRA a Roth IRA. Can I convert those dollars from traditional to Roth? Uh, the answer is yes, you can. Um, so let's say I had a million dollars in my traditional and I wanted to convert. I would never probably want to convert a whole million dollars because whatever I convert in that year is taxed to me as ordinary income in the year that I convert. So usually a, a strategy of converting a little bit each year or a chunk each year over a time frame helps reduce that, that tax. Because remember, taxes are based on how much income you have for that year. So the more you convert, and if you've got earned income, you don't wanna be paying 38% on all those dollars that are getting converted. So there's definitely a tax component to this analysis on whether I convert or not. Another big time to convert, like what just happened to us in COVID, with the markets pulled back big time. Exactly. Think about if you converted your individual positions after that big correction, that we had earlier this year, and now you've had all this growth, you would have now captured all that upside in tax-free growth. Granted, you would have had to take bite the bullet and pay the tax on that conversion earlier. Some people could do it, some people can't because they're just in too high of a tax bracket, but all that growth would have been tax-free. So down markets, a, a time to convert. If you're in an abnormally low income year, you might wanna to look to convert in that year. Um, but once you do it, you used to be able to reverse that. You can't do it anymore. So uh, once you do it, it's done, but you don't have to do all of it. You can do uh, however, do whatever dollar amount you want to do each year to convert. Jeff, please, um, we want to warn them about the way to pay that tax. Don't, you want to cover the part how you don't want to use the money in that, uh, uh, that traditional IRA to pay the tax. Let's say this I was going to listen to this. Let's say I was going to convert um, $200,000 and I might be in a 30% tax bracket, you would not want to withhold the 30% out of that conversion. No. You would need the $60,000 elsewhere to pay the tax. Intuitively, a lot of people, they want, when they can, when they take distributions, they just have the money withheld out of the, out of the money. You don't want to do that in this, in this situation. You've worked very hard to get those dollars funded into that account. You certainly don't want to have it withdrawn um, to pay the tax. Plus, if it is withdrawn to pay the tax, that's considered a distribution. If you're under 59 and a half, it would be considered a penalty, even though you're using those dollars to pay tax, is also a penalty because you're under 59 and a half. So do not convert and withhold, convert the full amount and pay the tax with additional funds, usually in cash that you got sitting around in your, in your money markets and things of that nature. It is surprising how often that happens because the, the, the people think that's easier. Oh, just take it. Just take it from my investments. No, that's a, that's, a, that's a big mistake to make. Thank you, Jeff. Now, there is something called the backdoor Roth. Uh, that's a way that you can bypass the income test. And for physicians, they like this, but it's usually physicians starting out. There's something called the pro rata rule that you really have to watch out for because you can't just um, contribute to existing Roths in, in the form of a backdoor contribution. And what that backdoor contribution is, is you contribute a non-deductible contribution to uh, a traditional IRA, and then you convert those non-deductible contributions into the Roth, therefore bypassing the, um, the income test and getting Roth dollars into your account. It can, you, you need some help on this, and if you kind of try to do it on your own, make sure you look up the pro rata rule. Uh, it's something that's often overlooked, uh, but it's an essential part of the process of that Roth conversion. So very important to make sure you get it done. 
So just you know who's quick, got a handle on that? Our <laughs> residents and fellows do that all the time. Yeah, because they're the starting out with the pro rider rule. Is more income. Yeah, the pro rider rule isn't as, yeah. is as important uh, for somebody starting out. Um, so what we just covered, traditional IRA, if you qualify, you can take a deduction. You take the deduction on the front end, the money goes into the account, gross tax deferred, all taxed on the way out. You're forced to take distributions at age 72. Roth is the income test only. You don't get a deduction. All the growth is completely tax free. There's no required minimum distribution because the government's getting not getting any more money from tax revenue, so they allow you to keep it in there forever. So you can keep it in there and not a bad asset for a legacy uh, asset to leave to your to your estate because no tax owed. All right. And we convert like Ross. I covered that too. We like Ross. Next up, we've got um, pension and defined contribution, 401ks, 403Bs, SEPs, and simples. Mike, you wanna you wanna address uh, pensions? Okay. Uh, most of your wealth for retirement is going to come from qualified plans, plans from your practice. There's basically, and by the way, the reason that that happens is because whether it's a pension plan, profit sharing, whatever, your employer is taking the money out of your pocket before you even see it because the contributions are being made um, without you receiving the money. Basically, there's two kinds. The first is a pension. Uh, a pension is where the, the, uh, the, the funds are funded by the employer. Every cent that goes in is from the employer. The employee can't put any money in, okay? And then they guarantee you usually a, an income stream at certain ages. Sometimes you can take it in a lump sum, but usually it's paid in an income stream. You don't see pensions much at all anymore because they're too expensive for the employer in the amount of money that they have to put out and guarantee. You still see it in uh, some of the government bases. You're going to see the, uh, uh, the pension plans, but in uh, the outside market, in an ordinary market, you don't really see that. So that's a pension. If you have one, you're lucky and it's a good thing. So that's a pension. Dollars go in for you, the employee, from your employer. The other main way of funding a qualified retirement plan, especially in your cases, is going to be the 401k plan. In a 401k plan, the money comes in from both the employer and the employee. For example, the employee puts money into it, the mutual funds or whatever they're investing in, they put their dollars in, they get a deduction for every cent that you put in there. And then in many, and in especially in medical practices, you're going to see where your employer will match up to a certain percentage, a, a percentage let's say 3%, that they will match you dollar for dollar on. And, and the good practices, they all have it. So I'm sure that most of you already have the match in there. But that is all free money. So you fund that and your employer is going to fund in extra dollars and match what you're putting in. Very, very big part of the retirement asset uh, accumulation for um, professionals, period, especially physicians. Profit sharing plan, you put in and the employer can put in. Pension plan, just the employer puts in, you get a guaranteed income. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, so just some of the the, um, the specifics on 401ks. Uh, usually you have a Roth versus traditional component inside your 401k plan. Mm -hmm. So Mike alluded to deduction. That's only if you choose the traditional version. If you choose the Roth version uh, or Roth con con contributory method, then you don't get a deduction. Okay. So this is where if you want to contribute to a Roth and you're a high dollar earner, this is where you go. Um, you can do a cap of 19,500. If you're under age 50, you're going to do an additional 6,500 if you're over age 50. So I know I want to max out my plan. Next step is what do I want to use? Do I want to use traditional or do I want to use Roth? Um, the match is always pre-tax. So if I did all Roth contributions over my life, the match would always be uh, taxable on the way out. My contributions plus growth would be tax free if I only had done Roth. Okay. So traditional versus Roth. Then I have to choose my investments. Inside the, inside the plan document, they have a lineup of funds. Um, you'll see target dates a lot in there, which will be retirement in 2030. That means as you approach that 2030 timeframe, uh, the 2030 date, they're going to start to make you more conservative 
avenue approach. All right, there's index funds, active managed funds. It's up to you to decide which fund choices you want inside that or which funds you want to use inside your asset allocation. So the money's inside there growing, all right? Um, something to watch out for in the match side. If you are the physician and you own the practice, uh, you need to be watching out for what's called the testing levels, which means if you can't contribute a max out and your, your lower paid employees can't max out either. So there's a, there's a ratio there. To avoid that, what I'd look at is what's called the safe harbor contribution. Um, if you're an That's owner, you safe harbor, that bypasses the testing requirements, great idea to use. All right, now, when you contribute, when you contribute dollars or you get dollars contributed for you, there's vesting. That means you can't take that money right away because the company doesn't want to give you money and then let you walk away. Kind of have a, a handcuff relationship there a little bit. Um, so your contribution's always vested. Uh, their contributions, they'll probably have a vesting schedule, which means you can't take it out after a certain, over a certain period of time. Yes, um, and most of the practices you're going to see will all have that match in there because they're using that to max out and they want to keep their employees and they want to keep their physicians. So it's very, very common in the, uh, in the practices you'll be in or the hospitals you'll be in. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in the 401k plans, uh, you are going to be subject to required minimum distribution if you leave it in there when you retire. We're going to talk about that later on. Right. So 401ks are for for-profit for organizations. 403Bs are for nonprofit organizations. So if you're working in a hospital, most likely you've got a 403B plan if it's a, if it's a nonprofit. Right. Same contribution limits, same discussion, decision on whether I want to do a traditional versus Roth contributory um, uh, status, and then the same limits as far as contribution limits. Um, but once again, all the money goes in there. If you take traditional, you get a deduction. If you choose Roth, no deduction. Roth, everything's tax free. Uh, traditional, everything's taxable. Very simple there. We like Roths. We like Roths. If you have uh, 1099 income or you're just a solo practitioner uh, or you have maybe you're, it's a, a partner or a spouse is working in, in collaboration with you or you're doing some consulting on the side and you've got some 1099 income, SEPs are a good option. Um, you can do uh, up to 25% of your comp not to exceed 57,000. So this is 1099 income. This is we give you the opportunity to contribute some more dollars and, and offset some of that 1099 income that you might get from consulting or side business or something like that. In theory, you could be doing maxing out your 401k and you could also do a step if you had some 1099 income, you just can't go over that $57,000 aggregated number annually. The trick here is why a lot of people don't use the SEP um, is because if you have employees, whatever you do for yourself, you have to do for your employees. Which means, if I do 20% for myself, I have to do for all 20% for all my employees, and they're immediately vested of when I give them those dollars. So you can imagine that if they're not happy, they might stick around until they get that SEP money, and then they can take off. So something you need to watch out for. That's why SEPs don't work well if you've got a, a few, more than a few employees. Yeah, you don't see them that much anymore. They used to be around maybe 10, 12 years ago. You used to see a lot of them. Uh, it's just gotten too complicated for the solo practitioner or uh, the, the closely held. Yeah. If you got 1099 income, they work. But if not, then you know, that's kind of it. Uh, simple plans. Uh, this is if, if, you're a, if you're a practice just starting out and with 401k plans, and if you put those into place, there's costs associated with that. Um, the costs have come down pretty significantly, but if you really want a real basic a startup plan, a simple makes sense. Um, a simple plan, the, the contribution limits are lower, uh, $13,500 with a $3,000 catch-up. Uh, but these are real simple, as they sound. You, you can start them up. Everybody gets their own account. You, you, you do payroll contributions, and the money gets in the account and nice and easy. It's very low cost to administer. So for startups, simples usually work. You usually grow up into a 401k plan over time. Yeah, we'll do them. We don't see many solo practitioners, obviously, anymore. But even in the small groups, we'll start them out. The CPAs and, I, and ourselves, we work with them. Start them in a SEP. It's cheap. It's easy. And then Jeff used a great word. We graduate them into a, a, a regular plan after that. But in the beginning, it keeps our expenses down way low. 
Okay, so we covered, uh, you'll notice that we skipped past the social security part of that. We're gonna do a different social security presentation uh, momentarily. We're just gonna go through distributions and then I'm, we're gonna do a different version of social security. The content in the book is really great on social security. However, we got a easy, more user-friendly version of a, of, a, of a different course we teach. Uh, so we're gonna be doing social security right after we finish distributions. Uh, so here we're going to talk about taking money out of pension plans and 401ks and 403bs. Right. So let Mike, let's start off with 401ks. Okay. 401ks, remember, are funded by both you and the employer. If you want to take the money out and you're below 59 and a half, you're going to pay a 10% non-deductible excise tax, including uh, in addition to the regular full income tax. Okay. Um, when you're talking about uh, a, a pension plan, a pension plan, the money's going to come out, it, it's all going to be taxed, okay? One of the things, and, and I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you the floor back in a minute, Jeff, but one of the things that I want to po uh, point out, a mistake that's made uh, very commonly, is that when, you're, when you get ready to start taking money out of your retirement plans, especially in a pension or something, they're going to give you choices about how you want to take the money. You can, you can just, they will offer you something that says, we'll pay you money for the rest of your life. They'll annuitize it for you, okay? And, and, and guarantees it for the rest of your life. And let's say there they'll give you um, 5,000 a month. I'm just using these numbers out of the sky here. They'll give you 5,000 a month. But then they'll say, well, if you have a spouse and you want the spouse to be covered for his or her life also, well, we're not going to give you five thousand. We'll give you three thousand. Hey, Mike, Mike, I don't, want to, I don't want to interrupt you, but why don't we just cover that now then? Because you're going over the pension part that was after the four hundred one k part. So you're talking about all the numbers here. Why don't we just Why don't we just do it? Yeah, There's let's this. do that. And that'll 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 explain a lot of what I was just saying. Yeah. So here's your choices. Why don't we just cover those choices, and then you can cover that chart. Okay. Joint and fifty percent survivor. That means that, the, that you die, you get, you get your amount. When you die, your survivor gets 50% of the benefit. You can get a period certain where you say, I want a guarantee on this money. And they guarantee to pay for 10 years, at minimum 10 years, or minimum 20 years. That's another choice. Or you can get, it, or you can say, I want to cover my spouse. The first three that I just said, you get more dollars on there but you're going to hurt your spouse or uh, if you, if you have one. Good. Yeah. So really your choices are single life, which just pays out for your life and then it ends. So very dangerous. You do not want to make the wrong choice. When you go no. into, make, you walk into human resources, you need to make sure you've done all the math. And if you sign off that you don't want a spousal benefit here, you better make sure you've done the homework because it's going to be your highest payment. But once you make that decision to, to take that income, there is no going back. You can't go back in and say, oh, I made a mistake. I do want to cover my spouse now. Granted, they have to sign off on it. But unfortunately, a lot of people aren't educated when they walk into that room and both parties sign off. And it's a single income, life only. It ends when you die. And that's it. And then so you up, cannot change it. No. Join 100% survivor. Um, I die. My, the spouse continues. So Mike just covered three and I covered two. Let's look at them in terms of numbers. So if a single life, this is just an example, might be paying me 2875 If I were to die, my spouse gets zero, my partner gets zero. Joint 100 is gonna be lower, and this is based on age. So they look at the two ages. The bigger the difference in age, the lower the benefit's gonna be on the, on the survivor, because now they're insuring two lives. So you've got joint 100, uh, $2,010. If I die, and I'm, I'm, I'm the, I was the person who worked for the company, my, my partner or our spouse gets the 2010. At 50%, I'm, as long as I'm alive, I'm getting the 2,500, but at death, it will drop to 1,250, half. All right, so you really need to make sure you know these choices. You request these choices from the pension administrator and you do the math and you tie these into your financial plan. If I had a big life insurance policy, I would have to be a really big one in order to, to take that other choice, which is the, the, the uh, single life. If I've got a surviving spouse, I want to make sure that that person's okay. 
I'm probably going to take one of the survivor options. You know, yeah, because the numbers are really tough to beat in those options. They're yeah. tough to beat. Don't make that mistake. All right. So we, we unfortunately, we jumped a little bit ahead. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the chapter now and cover 401ks. Um, on the 401k side, you really have a few choices. You leave the money in the plan. Uh, you're limited on your investment choices there. Remember, you are paying fees in the 401k plan. There's fees associated inside those accounts. You just have to make sure you understand what, what's called the expense ratio. And then the distribution, they, uh, it becomes cumbersome. If I've got a plan, 401k plan, I want to take a monthly income, a lot of plans don't allow that. Mike, what would you really want to do inside, when you retire? Yeah, when you retire, um, the plan that you have at the office or the hospital, the plan that you have is, is designed for more of accumulation, not disposing income. One of the things, if you move it out of the 401k, 403b, and roll it into an IRA, IRAs are really uh, designed to spit out income and to make the ease of getting income to you. It, they give you a lot more choices because you can make whatever investment um, uh, mix that you want. You are no longer at the um, place of business anymore, so you've really lost contact with them. But the important thing is that it just makes withdrawing money from the plan so much easier, so much easier than having to go through the employer again. I, th I see that um, as being critical, Jeff. Yep. You know, so you can leave the money, you leave the money there. You can transfer it to a new employer's plan. You get the same issues that you had in the first option. You roll the money out. I want control of the IRA. I want to be able to invest it in whatever I want. So I'd be crazy not to move it to the IRA and take control. Whether you're doing it yourself, using an advisor, I want the money in the IRA for access to funds. Um, taking a lump sum, that makes no sense because you have to pay tax on everything that comes out of this account. So you want to make sure you roll the money over correctly. Um, there's a chart here. Um, that shows what you don't want to do, all right? And what you don't want to do is when you're rolling money out of your 401k, you never want to make the check payable to yourself unless you want to spend it. And here's why. By law, they have to withhold 20%. So in this example, all right, I, want to, I have 100,000 in my account. Let's, just, let's say it's a million dollars. It's a million dollars in my account. I want to roll it over, but I don't know where I want to put it yet and I'm frustrated with the plan administrator, so just say, send me my money. That's a mistake, because you're gonna get a check for 800,000. They would have to withhold 20%. You have 60 days to get that 20%, in, this, in the example of a million, to get back into your account, and if you don't, it could be assessed penalties, and it's treated as income, right? So you don't wanna do that. So the first step is you wanna know where it's going, you wanna open that account with your custodian, the IRA, you then call the plan administrator and say, I want to roll my money out. They'll ask who the check, make the check payable to. You say you're to the institution. <laughs> you almost said yourself. <laughs> XYZ financial. <laughs> check comes, the check will come to you. You deposit in the account, but it's never made. It will say XYZ financial for the benefit of Jeff Anderson or whatever your name is. Then you can put that amount. Now it creates no taxation. It's a nice, clean, that's called a rollover. And Once it's in the IRA, it, it's treated differently. Like. What Jeff just said is, is very important because he mentioned the 60-day window that you have to get that 20% back in, and people swear on a stack of Bibles that I'll get that in, don't worry, I'm going to get that money in within 60 days, and almost every time I have a physician do that, or anyone, I mean, do that, uh, they, they miss the 60 days. One brokerage house you know, has a problem with something else. Uh, and it doesn't get done. And the, and the penalties and the taxes, it's, it's terrible. Don't listen to anyone that says to do the 60-day um, uh, method of doing that. Jeff was right on target when he said that. That, that really applies to IRAs as well. So uh, once, you, when, once the money is in the IRA, let's say I'm with XYZ and I don't, I don't like them anymore. I'm going to switch to a different money manager. And that's, uh, you know, Vanguard. So I want to move. You can then, there's one, you can do a 60 day rule once a year. We strongly advise against it. And right. what that means is because it's in the IRA, they don't have to withhold 20%. So in my example, you could get the check for a million dollars and you've got 60 days to get it back in. Don't do that. Because like Mike said, 
no one ever gets the money back in within 60 days. You're exposing yourself to some, some tax issues. What you would do is you would open an IRA at the receiving institution. They request for the transfer and it goes nice and clean and there's no tax owed. That's called a custodial transfer. So no withholding there, no mandatory withholding in IRAs. There is a mandatory withholding in 401k. So uh, very big difference there. Everyone thinks that if they roll their money out of 401k, they can just take it and invest it later. No, 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 you can't. It's all taxes, ordinary income in that year. And believe it or not, common mistake. Yeah, a big one. Expensive mistake. Expensive, yeah, that's for sure. Um, company securities retirement plan. If you own publicly traded stock in your 401k plan, there's a strategy where you can pay um, <clears throat> long-term capital gains on that stock versus ordinary income. So there's a tax savings there. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, that's something you need to talk to an advisor about. We're not going to get into it tonight, but it's just something that we want to point out that if you do own publicly traded stock in your 401k, uh, there's a way to execute that distribution with a tax savings. Yeah, not as common in physician practices or hospitals. You don't see it that much, but it's out there. Yeah, if the, if the, if the hospital is publicly traded and you own that stock in it, that would be an example. Right. Um, annuity income. We covered this already. This was your pension choices. Um, we're not going to cover that again. Um, back to 401ks. If you have a 401k plan and you're not happy with the investment choices inside the plan, oftentimes if you're over 55, uh, they allow you to do what's called an in-service withdrawal option. And what that means is that I'm still working there. I'm still contributing dollars to the plan. However, I open up an IRA and I can move a percentage of those dollars out. So let's say I had a million dollars in my 401k. I'm not happy with the choices inside there. Um, I want to move. Usually you can move like eight, 900,000 out in that example. Uh, you can roll that into an IRA. You have control of the asset now and you can invest it however you want. And the residual amount stays in there and you keep contributing and you keep working. A lot of people think that if I'm in the 401k, I can't touch that money till I retire. Not necessarily the case. What happens is some of the bigger level executives usually want to be able to take their money out and reinvest it somewhere else. They don't want all their money in the 401k. So they allow it, but they have to allow it for everybody. So they don't tell everybody, you have to ask. And if you find out you can, then that, that's allowable and you can do yes. it. Yes. In-service withdrawals, 10 years ago, you almost never heard of them. But within the last few years, you're seeing the employers having to do that. Uh, so it's very, it's common now, but it's recent. That's a recent change. Yep. Now everyone loves uh, required minimum distributions. Uh, at 72, they did just raise the age from yeah, 70 and a half to 72. Uh, and at 72, out of your uh, all pre-tax dollars, Roths do not get calculated, but everything in your 401ks, 403bs, SEP simples, pre-tax has to start coming out at age 72. So what it's based on is, let's say I'm 73 years old. I would add up all of my IRA accounts and 401k accounts the previous year, and there's a divisor, a fact, a multiplier. You, at the start, it's usually around four, it's around 4%. So on a million, I got to take out $40,000 in that year. They don't care which account it comes from. They just want to make sure you get it done. And if you don't, it's a 50% penalty plus ordinary income tax. So it's pretty hefty. We don't want to see anyone do that. Um, the best way to do that usually is go on automatic, have your advisor put you on automatic, because as Jeff just said, you don't want to have to pay that 50% penalty. Absolutely. Uh, one other big change is um, in the non-spouse beneficiary designated the designation. If you want an IRA and your children or somebody else is the beneficiary, or let's say you received money from a grandmother and you inherited those dollars in an IRA, it's called an IRA BDA. Um, the new rules, are, you used to have to take that based on your life expectancy, um, which gave you the ability to stretch that, that, that distribution out over your lifetime which was pretty nice. Um, now, all, if you look at the last point here, um, the non-spouse inherited um, IRA plans must be distributed within 10 years. So they stopped the ability to stretch that out. You gotta take it out over 10 years now um, and force that taxation out. They want the revenue. Uh, so that was one of the changes that just recently went in place in addition to beefing up, bumping up the uh, RMD age to 72. Um, so that's the distribution chapter. So we covered how to execute rollovers and how to make those pension choices um, when you retire. 
We also covered RMDs as well. All very important stuff. The amazing thing is with your RMDs, you, you may be thinking, geez, that's good. I get to take some money out. I take some money out. Most clients, by the time they're taking their RMDs, don't want to take them out. They're trying to leave the money in there. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> Did we have any questions on uh, that chapter, Dr. Cromer? Um, nothing particular about uh, distribution questions, uh, but a question came up. When do you know? When do you know to fire or switch investment advisors? I have a history of hiring managers who do nothing but bill the management fee. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that in the investment chapter. Okay. So yes. We'll, we will address that. Things to look for in an investment advisor. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Their, name, their names need to start with Jeff and Mike, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, no. No. No, no, no. But we'll, we'll go over all the characteristics of what you really want to look for. Shut that guy off named Cromer or something. <laughs> like that. Okay, so we are going to uh, jump to Social Security. Uh, this this, yeah, this uh, part of the presentation is not in the book. However, there is a great section on Social Security in the book. Uh, but we chose just to show you kind of a different uh, social security through a different lens using this presentation. We think it's just, a, it flows a little nicer than the other presentation. So um, yeah. without further ado, uh, let's start talking about social security, Mike. Well, social security, one of the things, um, and you can bring up this slide, uh, Jeff. One of the things with social security is people say, well, you know, social security is not going to be here. You know, uh, rate of inflation, this, the economy, this. So uh, I'm not dependent on Social Security. That's just not true. Social Security will, will be there. Interesting point a lot of people don't realize. When, the so when President Roosevelt signed the Social Security law, the beginning age for retirement, for you to be able to collect full Social Security, was age 65. And do you know uh, what the, uh, uh, the lifespan was then? It wasn't 84, it was 65, okay? So they had to change that in the first year, okay? There are ways to, to change uh, Social Security to increase the funding. And it's happened a number of times. It happens all the time, okay? Um, what the, they, there's different ways they can do it. They can raise the normal retirement age, which they've done a couple of times in the last few years, and that'll help fund it. Instead of 65, made it, make it 66. Oh, how about 66 and a half? And then, you know, that's one way to do it. And that populates uh, the, the, the money in there, okay? Uh, they can also have, a lot of people don't even know this, uh, the amount of money that we earn, there's a certain amount that we have to pay social security taxes. Right now, it's $137,700 of income is subject to the Social Security tax. So Social Security, if they start running in the problems, they can raise that, that, that minimum amount from 137 higher. And they've done that in the past. And that has worked, okay? And as I said, they can change the age. They can raise it, well, as they just did from 66 to 67, and they can and do it again. This works very smoothly. It's happened in past years, okay? So it's going to be here. Social and Social Security will be here. And I'll tell you something else you don't hear that much about Social Security. They have a great COLA, a cost of living adjustment on it. And it's, it's a guaranteed one. And it's, it's higher than most COLA th on other things. So... Before he gets into the exact numbers, yes, Social Security will be there. And yes, they have ways to fix it. And they've done it in the past and they're going to do it. Because if nothing else, by inflation, we earn more money. And guess what, everybody? Not everybody's retiring at 55 or 65. People are working longer and living longer. So these numbers go right in there. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Uh, so Mike talked about... Um, the average annual social security increase is 2.6%. Uh, 
Uh, some years they don't give it to you, some years they do. It's based on the consumer price index. So something to watch out for. But assuming a historical 2.6% cost of living, um, if your monthly benefit is $2,000 today, um, it, you, you're, and you take out that distribution over 10 years, you've taken $270,000 out of the program. If you've taken it for, for 20 years, you've taken 600,000 out of the program. If you live for 30 years, you're taking a million dollars out of the program. So that's a big number. So you really wanna make sure that you execute your distribution strategy correctly, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. This is another way to look at it. This, this addresses what Mike talked about, the cost of living increase. Um, if you're getting $2,000 today, 10 years from now, you'll be getting 2,585. In 20 years, you'll be getting 3,300, and in 30 years, you'll be getting 4,300. So that cost of living adjustment, this is like a really good pension plan that pays a really nice cost of living adjustment. You just don't think about it in those terms, but you've paid a lot of money into this system as, as high income earners. So you wanna make sure you get your money's worth in the way that you execute this distribution. Yeah, you know, Jeff and I, we manage a lot of retirement plans and, and, and money in them, and we know what uh, the, all the plans are doing people sort of ignore social security in their cost of living adjustment. It, it's, it, it's very significant, it's very good. Yeah, so the question is how much am I gonna get um, the, the, what's called the AIME, which is your average. Believe it or not, they will go back 35 years. They take your highest 35 years of earnings and they have a formula that if anybody really wants to get numbers, to numbers out there, feel free, that's the, that's the <laughs> equation that they use. Um, <laughs> But when you look at your statement and you see your full retirement age or your FRA, um, they calculate that's how much, that's, that's the amount you'll get or your primary insurance amount based on those 35 years, your highest 35 years. So when you get your statements, it shows those years on it. You want to make sure that they didn't forget some income on there. You want to make sure those numbers are, are valid. They make mistakes. That goes into that equation. They make a lot of mistakes, believe it or not. So um, that's good to know. Um, but um, should I claim early at 62? Um, your benefits will be reduced if you go early. And let's take a look at those numbers because they can be alarming. Uh, we're gonna do that in a minute. A big variable that goes into this though is how am I, am I healthy or not? You know, if I'm not healthy and my life expectancy is not that long, then I'm probably gonna take it at the earliest age of 62 because I don't have longevity. If I'm healthy, then I'm probably gonna wait till 70 and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But don't think about it's just all about the money. It's really about your life expectancy and how long you're gonna live. If you've got some health concerns, most people take it earlier because they wanna get those dollars in. They don't wanna have paid into it and then die early and not get any benefit out of it. Um, that is the harsh reality of, of how it works. So um, what age can I start taking it without any a reduction? Uh, it's based on the year you were, you were born. So anybody over 1960 or later uh, would be 67. And then this chart shows uh, the different years and at what age and what month you can take it out without any reduction. That's called your full retirement age or FRA is the proper terminology. So this chart's a really good one. Um, this shows, let's assume that my FRA is age 67. And uh, Mike, Jeff, I wanna go early. What's that gonna cost me? Well, you're looking, if you take it at age 62, you're looking at a 30% reduction off your primary insurance amount. That was that number that it took the 35 years of calculation. Uh, you get 30% reduction. So pretty significant reduction in your benefit amount. Mike, Mike we always talk about this. Well, uh, I, I want to see if you're going to bring up the makes famous sense if you wait. age 70. It goes, it goes up by 8% a year <laughs> yeah. every year after your full retirement age up to 70. And as you can see here, we're looking at 124% of your primary insurance amount. So if you go early, the difference between going early and taking it and maxing out, you know, that it's 70% less and it's 24, that's a 54% reduction uh, by taking it early versus waiting to age 70. Jeff, so, if I can make a comment on this. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people say, I'm taking it as soon as I, as I can get it. Then you have another group that says, I'm taking it as soon as I have full in my full benefit, full retirement amount. That's when I'm taking it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wait until age 70 to take it because it takes me 18 years of living to, to break even. But here's in real life retirement 
is is can, is is really felt differently. The older you get, the more you're you're going you're going to feel better having more money. If you can make it to seventy, and the people, most of the people probably in this conference, you know, will hold off, even though you're not getting that money from 62 or, or qualifying age 66 or 67, hold off to age 70 because the 8% increase per year that Jeff just said mounts up tremendously. And, and it's not a lot, a, a big difference for you. But when you get older, you are going to be so much happier knowing that your money's increasing faster. But the other thing is this, it's increasing faster, but you've got the COLA on there making it increase even more. So take those 8% bonus every year, 8% increase that you wait to age 70. Strongly recommend it. Obviously, if you have health problems, as Jeff said, you know, that's, that's a whole different scenario. But don't listen to the people that say, oh, 18 years long, no. Wait, hold to 70. Unless you're unhealthy. <laughs> you're unhealthy. Yeah, unless you're unhealthy. Let's talk about how social security is taxed. Um, if you take it early, uh, you really don't want to make more than $18,000 a year. So if I go out before my full retirement age, I do not want to make more than $18,240. You have to give back every dollar, a dollar for every $2 you earn, plus the taxation. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, you want to wait. If you're going to work, um, don't take it early. Wait After your full retirement age, you can make $10 million. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's yeah. just... Don't take, if you take it early, they don't want you double dipping and taking it early and working and making a lot of money, all right? Which leads me to taxation. Um, this is, is my social security going to be taxed? And a lot of people get upset with this because you, you paid social security tax into the program and then they tax you on the way out. So it's really not that fair, but it's just life. So um, I'd make a bet everybody on this call is going to pay 85%. What do you think, Jeff? Absolutely, because here's how they add it up. They take your income, and let's say your social security, your combined social security benefit was fifty thousand. They take half of that and add twenty-five thousand back in. And most most physicians have municipal bonds in their non-qualified portfolios, which is generating tax-free interest. They even make you add your tax-free interest yeah. in. And the married filing jointly number is forty-four thousand dollars. So you have to be under thirty-two thousand not to pay any tax. Everybody's over forty-four thousand. So that means that $50,000 of, of, of Social Security income, you take 85% of that and add that into your taxable income, and that's taxed at whatever marginal tax bracket you're in. Okay? It, doesn't so it doesn't mean you're being taxed at an 85% rate. It's just that the money that is, is being moved and being included in your taxable income, 85% uh, of those dollars will be counted. So for every $100 that you make, they're going to count $85 as uh, increased taxable income. Correct. All right. So I want to talk about a couple different strategies here. Um, let me move my thing here. All right. So spousal benefit. Now, uh, this spousal benefit was, is, was really designed to protect the stay-at-home mom or dad. Um, and what happens here is, you, as a spouse, you're entitled to no less than half of the higher earner's wages, uh, benefit amount, okay? So the spousal benefit here, John's primary insurance amounts $2,000. Jane's is only 800. If Jane applies at her full retirement age, she'll get no less than half of John's. So she would get 1,000. So when she goes in, they wouldn't give her the 800, they would give her the 1,000, assuming that she was at her full retirement age. And also John has to be filed, filed for taking his social security. If John hadn't filed yet, she would be taking her 800 until John files. Once John files, she would jump up to the full spousal benefit, which would be half. So spousal benefit, important to understand. Um, I just covered that part. The other, the, the primary earner has to be claiming. So you would take the smaller amount in the beginning, and then when the higher earner claims and starts taking it, you jump up. And when you file, you file for taking both, they'll automatically bump you up um, to the next amount. Um, this is a hybrid strategy. We really like this strategy. Um, this integrates Mike's waiting till 70 uh, num um, strategy. But let's say 
um, in that example uh, before, what was it? Uh, Jane has 800 and John's is 2000. Let's say John waits to uh, age 70 and Jane would be taking hers early. And what will happen is when, when John would file at age 70, she would jump up to half of, of John's. But in the meantime, she's been taking it. But what they just did here was maximize the benefit for one person. And that works out really nicely because you've got, you've got, you capture that 8% growth rate. Also at death, you get the higher of the two. So by maximizing one, the higher amounts number, in the event that that higher earner dies, the surviving spouse would get the higher number. All right, so that's a big deal um, when you're planning for um, your social security benefit. You, at death, you get the higher of the two. You don't get both, you get the higher of the two. So that's a, that's a big one. Um, if you're widowed, um, you can start taking the, um, the, the, the benefit from the deceased early at age 60, or you could take yours at age 60. However, you do get it reduced. Uh, if you wait till your full retirement age, you uh, get the full amount of either the deceased or yours, whichever is higher at, uh, on the widow situation. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's... Joe and Julie are both married. Uh, both are over full retirement age. Julie's benefits 2000. Joe's benefits 1200. Julie dies. Joe notifies Social Security, and his 1200 benefit goes up to 2000. That that's an example of you get the higher of the two, but not both combined. Uh, this shows Joe and Julia married. Jo, Julie's uh, insurance amount is 2000. Julie files for Social Security at age 70. So she waited and she captured that extra 28%. So sure, Ben, if she starts getting paid at 2,560, Julie dies, Julie's survivor benefit will be 2,560. <clears throat> if Joe took it at age 60 because of the widow, he would be reduced and he would only get 71.5, which would be $1,830. If Joe claims his survivor benefit is full retirement age, he would get the full amount. So they do give the opportunity for the widow or the surviving spouse to take it early, even earlier than 62, but you get an even more of a reduction than you do um, at 62. So it's a, it's a balance there. Um, ideally, you can wait till 67 and get that full amount if, if, you're, right. if, you're, if you've got enough saved. Um, for the survivor benefit, you have to be married at least nine months. That's really the key there. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So um, now this is always an interesting one. Yeah, if this is always interesting. If you're divorced, <laughs> you're not remarried. You can take off of, if your benefit is less than half of your prior spouses, you can get half of theirs. Um, and we always get these crazy questions like, well, what happens if I've been married twice, both for 10 years, can I add them both together? The answer to that question is no. You get the, higher, the half of the higher of the two. Whichever is higher, half of, half of uh, each one of them, whichever is higher you would take, or your own if that's higher. The other person doesn't know that you're claiming off of theirs. Uh, if you got divorced several times, you could have several people claiming off your social security if it was a high social security. It does not impact your social security payment if you're the person who they're claiming against. Yeah, that's so, important. It does not impact what you yeah. would receive. So if my PIA is 3,500, or they'll call it 3,000, and I could have two people collecting 1500 but I don't even know that they're claiming off me, honestly. I'm still getting my 3000 and everything's fine, okay? Uh, but once you get remarried, you have to, um, you can, if you get remarried, it's over and the deal's off, off the table. <clears throat> so, you know, as you can see, Social Security is a little bit complicated. Um, so this is really an interesting way to put it. Um, in life, would you rather be, would you be early or delayed or would you rather be a, pay a penalty or get a bonus? And this really rings about taking an earlier waiting. You know, I'd rather get the bonus if I could, um, and I'd rather be delayed if I could. So taking the bonus works, um, but there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, if Most physicians have plenty of retirement assets, so Social Security isn't a huge part of that distribution. So they want to really just maximize what they put in to maximize what they get out. 
So like Mike had said, take, wait until 70, at least the higher earner wait until 70 uh, is usually the best strategy. Um, and if there is a, a lower earner, maybe have that lower earner take it early and start getting some money into the household and defer the other one at age 70 and take that high number. And at death, they get the higher of the two. So you protect that component of it as well. We realize that the amount that uh, this audience is going to be receiving in Social Security is, is a very low amount. But people have a, a great interest in Social Security and exactly what happens. So this may not seem like a large um, amount of, of money to you, and, but, it, it's, but it's, uh, it's there. And it's used, and it's used, and it's used. Okay, sorry, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. Uh, that concludes the Social Security part. Um, if we've got any questions, we can answer them now. If not, we're going to move on. We are going a little bit faster. We understand that. We've got a lot of material, so we want to make sure we get everybody out here in time. Okay, I just, I just put, I just, uh, put a feeler out to see if anybody had any specific questions concerning Social Security. Um, I'll wait here for a minute and see if anybody comes back on. Uh, go ahead. What were you going to say, though? I was just going to say that... Um, because of COVID, because we're, we're doing this uh, virtual like this, usually uh, we have these in, in person where we're asked to come and speak somewhere. And the questions go back and forth and the sessions take longer. So our timing's a little bit off because we're not getting as many questions. So yeah, we're, I'm sure. why we're running a little ahead. Oh, uh, we're not really, well, you know, we're running right on schedule right now. Well, that's <laughs> we ahead, normally. Condense <laughs> we condensed this for Zoom. <laughs> so we condensed it for the Zoom meeting, so we're, we're going to hit it just on time. So, uh, <laughs> no more questions, let's get rolling. Uh, risk management. Mike, you want to talk about disability? Um, yes, yeah, so if you remember last week when uh, we were introducing ourselves and we were going over uh, certain points, um, and I said, I'm, an ex I'm probably a little OCD and I'm, I'm, I'm very objective, but you have to watch out for me when it comes to disability insurance. Remember, 80% uh, of my clients are physicians. I've been on the faculty over there for, um, what, 20, for over 25 years. So I'm around physicians all the time. It is such a tragic thing to see uh, someone go down. And I'm telling you, I know people, uh, I have clients that are friends of yours that are on disability. And it is, it is, if they don't have their income protected, it is a tragic, terrible thing. So I say this probably being a little subjective here, but you need to protect. The biggest asset that you have isn't what you're earning right now, it's your ability to earn income. And you need to protect that. Because if, if that happens, it's a tragedy. And I mean, it affects the children also. So disability is important. But that's my opening subjective comment, okay? <laughs> Here's the objective side of it. The objective side of it is that there's basically two kinds of uh, disability insurance you can get. You can get the group insurance at work, okay? Which I, well, I think you should, by the way. And the good thing about the group insurance is, number one, it's cheap, okay? And number two, it's easy to get. Because on group disability insurance, they don't even underrate the policy until you go on claim, okay? Uh, the definitions aren't as good. I'm not gonna get into details on this. I'm just saying group is okay, but you know, there's something called individual non-cancelable disability insurance. That's what you need, especially as a physician, because the definition in uh, individual non-cancelable is this, number one, if you can't perform each and every duty of your specialty, you're considered totally disabled. You get paid every cent of your disability insurance, okay? That is extremely important because your, your subspecialties are so different and um, that's important, okay? The other thing is that they can cancel you no matter how bad a risk you get once that's issued, they cannot cancel you. Group can be canceled, one of the reasons it's cheap, and it will be, and if you leave, you lose it. Individual non-can, you wanna to go to them, uh, one of those companies, there's, there's three or four really good co companies out there that have really great um, disability contracts for physicians. So you've got a, a nice choice there, but you wanna make sure you have own oc, they also, they call it own occupation. It's a your specialty clause, okay? 
uh, it's paid. They'll put a waiting period. You know, uh, the costs are pretty close to each other on those on the main companies. The way that you can adjust the price up or down might be how you structure it. For example, the longer you wait uh, before you get paid, let's say you became disabled t tonight, the longer you wait, the lower the cost is going to be on the premium because the insurance company doesn't have to. So it's very common. You don't see first aid coverage that much anymore. Maybe on some of the groups you do a little bit, but usually in the individual non-cancelables, you're going to see a 90-day wait. That means you have to have an emergency reserve of at least 90 days, which I hope all of you have. You know, it's four to six months according to CFPs. But if you push that waiting period out to 90 days, the cost goes down or maybe even 180 or something. But that pushes it out and it lowers the cost. Your specialty, your cost, they pay, most of them pay to age 65, okay? Um, that's what the benefit period will be. And then also, um, at when, if you have a policy and you turn 65 and you, you get older, most uh, of the high-end companies, the good companies, they're going to let you renew that uh, past 65, usually up to age 70. Each year, uh, you can renew it and extend the, the policy. And the thing that they ask, you have to have earned income. But uh, I'm not going to go into this too long, except the message is, uh, when it comes to risk management in regards to safety in this area, uh, disability insurance is critical, critical. And I, I, I know I got a little subjective there, but that's, that's the gosh darn truth. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, uh, one thing is you always want to pay the premiums. Uh, do, oh, not have, yeah. do not have the, co the company pay the premiums for you. Uh, the reason is if you pay the premiums, the, the benefit will become tax-free to you. If they pay the premiums uh, for your benefit, the, the benefit will be taxable to you. So you ideally, you do not want the yeah, benefit. And, and if you have group of work, work you, by the way, you usually want to put the individual non cancelable contract in first, okay, because they'll limit how much you can get, usually 60% of income, and then put your group in on top of it. And um, the thing is this, if you're buying the individual, um, pay for yourself because Jeff just pointed out that the money, if you pay for it out of your own personal money, all the, in, all the income during disability is tax-free, okay? Um, okay? Now, now one other thing, if you have a group, you're at work and your practice has a group and they're paying for it. When you first, you want to say to them, here's, here's a, not a trick, but here's something to do. Just tell them that money that you're paying for my disability insurance, do me a favor, count that as compensation and say, oh, we can't do that. And then just say, just show that as a bonus. It's a taxable bonus. It's going to be minuscule compared to your income. So make that premium and they do it. They all do it. They might delay it or something, but they all do it. You have them change the premium they're paying for your disability insurance to a, a bonus, and therefore you get tax income tax on it, and therefore even your group will come completely tax free. A lot of people don't realize that, but that's a, that's that's a, an option. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, uh, long term uh, care guys. I have a question on the um, disability insurance. Um, most of everybody's simple or traditional policy it uh, stops payment at age 65 you mentioned you have a chance of renewing it one year at a time is it correct that the premiums are going to double or triple every year up until the age of 70 no and is that no. they go up but they, they they definitely don't double and triple every year no okay definitely not but they go up yeah that's a case-by-case -case analysis yeah okay all right. Anything else? Someone mentioned another a question on Social Security. Um, if they look at the paperwork that comes in when someone is retiring and they see a, a mistake that Social Security Administration has made, how do they challenge that? You have to, you have to contact the Social Security Administration, and then you, you're going to need your tax returns to show them the evidence that's the case. Okay. You're going to need to show them that that, that income, in fact, did come in. It's on your return show it to them. It often happens two, 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 four, two sources of income. Maybe you did some side work for 1099. That's where it's, if you've got, or you've got a business and they mess it up all the time. So yeah, it's not uncommon to see that doctor. All right. Mike, long-term care. 
Uh, Long-term care. Um, you know, we we manage money, that's what we do. And, and one of the things you'll hear uh, is that- <laughs> Hey, Mike, I don't wanna interrupt you. Mike, the camera, you're getting very close to the camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> you get a little excited. You know, I get excited about this. <laughs> we like seeing you, but you know. We'll put the chains back on here. <laughs> On, uh, I, we will say, if you want to see assets that you build up, a lot of investment dollars, if you want to see them go away real fast, need long-term care. Because long-term care will eat up your money real fast. And, you know, it's a sin. You know, we work all our lives. We build great careers. And then at the end of our lives, we should, you know, we should um, be able to be okay financially. Nobody loves their kids more than I love mine or you love yours, but I don't want to be dependent on my children for long-term care like that, okay? So uh, it is needed. To make this short, uh, basic, they, they pay a daily benefit for you. You don't have to be a, in a, an institution somewhere. Most people with money, uh, they just stay home and they bring in all the care into their home. Um, so, and that's probably when you need it, that's what you would do. Okay, well, what the heck does this stuff cost? Okay, now usually you, 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 you go with an amount, how much per day do you want? 200, 300, 400, whatever. And that's how they calculate it for you, okay? And there's two basic kinds of ways to pay for it. One is you can buy long-term care coverage that's like buying a disability car uh, 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 policy or buying a car uh, insurance policy. You pay money. You know, every year or month, you pay in it and you don't get a cent back. That's one way to do it. But in the last few years, there's a different type of contract that's come out, a hybrid contract that's a combination of, it, it does have a long-term care benefit, but it also has, um, uh, a, it's a life insurance, whole life permanent cash buildup type policy hybrid, okay? And what, and what happens is this. As I said, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You can't pay it in increments. You can't pay it annual. You can't pay it monthly. You must pay in a lump sum. So let's say, for example, um, they say, okay, um, $100,000 will buy you $6,000, $9,000 a month, something like that, okay? So you have to take that $100,000 and deposit it, invest it, and put it and deposit it into that contract. Okay, so what happens is this. As soon as you put that 100,000 in, you're, it drops to like 94,000. You say, wait a minute, I just lost $6,000. But you will have the, um, the, um, uh, the benefit for long-term care. Plus, since it's a hybrid with life insurance, you'll have a death benefit. Plus, the cash value starts to build. If, I would imagine most of you, uh, you folks have some permanent cash value insurance, and as ugly as they are in the beginning, after five or six years, they're okay. In this contract, it takes about four and a half, maybe five years before your cash value is back up to 100 and continues to grow with dividends. So it's, it's a great way to do it. The death benefit is probably going to be at least 100,000 more than what you put in. But it's a great way to do it, but you have to have the money to do it, lump sum. They're, they're the two ways to do it. Good, Jeff. Um, all right. Uh, life insurance, Mike, want to talk about term first? Uh, let's get real basic here. Um, with life insurance, there's basically two kinds, permanent and term, okay? Per term insurance is meant to last for a certain period of time. Could be a 10-year term, could be a 20-year term, could be the age 65 term, but then it ends. Um, a good thing about term is it is very inexpensive in the beginning because um, if you have an annual renewable, which you see a lot of annual renewable, every year the premium goes up a little bit, it starts out very low. Um, but they say if, a, in a, if cardiac arrest doesn't kill you eventually, then when you see how high those term premiums get, that, that'll kill you. CPAs don't like term insurance because you don't get a cent back from it. It is a pure profit item for insurance company and less than 1% of term insurance is paid in death benefits. But you know what, so it's not great, but you, you know what, if you are someone, maybe a young couple with a couple of kids and you don't have the money and you can't afford to put it in a permanent cash buildup insurance, well then you know what, I don't care what the CBA say, 
that's that's something they have to do because it does give them low cost coverage, and uh, so so that's a good thing about it. But there's no cash buildup and it ends. Permanent uh, life insurance you hear it called cash value, whole life, ten pay life, all those things. What happens there is you get a death benefit, but you also build up a cash account next to it. If you go for a permanent cash build up, uh, build up life insurance contract, you always want to go to a company that's a mutual company, like a, um, a mass mutual, a uh, principal mutual, mutual New York, Northwestern. You want to go to one of them because they pay dividends. And most of those companies have been around a long time, 150, 180 years, and they've never missed a dividend. They're very secure. So you want to use a mutual company. Basic difference is one, you put in money, it's cheap in the beginning, prohibitive afterwards, but you have the coverage for your family. The other one is you have to put in more dollars because it's more of an investment along with insurance, but it builds up. Ugliest in the first four to six years because insurance companies have to put reserves aside for those who die, but I turn into a lot of money afterwards. Two basic types of life insurance. There's okay, also so, something, do you want to mention variable? Or no, I'll, I'll, cover the, I'll cover the next couple. So okay. my talk about term, no cash value, whole life, um, why, why we relate this to physicians, it's, it's asset protected. The dollars in those contracts um, are asset protected. So physicians like to save money in whole life contracts. They've got guarantees in there. They pay nice dividends. Um, so whole life makes a lot of sense. I the can't other believe that I forgot asset protection, all the talking yeah. I do on that. The other forms of, uh, of insurance are universal life. Those are interest rate sensitive. Uh, so they're tied to an interest rate. So when you originally took this policy out, if interest rates have dropped, you've got a problem. So you need to make sure you run an enforce illustration every year to make sure the amount of money that you're funding into these contracts is enough to make it last. Because what you don't want to have happen is that you get later on in life and all of a sudden the interest rates weren't what you expected and you've got a problem. Uh, so that's interest rate sensitive. Even more important um, than that is variable life. That's tied to the stock market. Uh, you, would, you take these, the, pre, the premiums, a portion of that goes into the market. And when you originally took this out, you may have assumed a very high rate of return. Uh, and as you get older, the cost of insurance continues to go up. So these policies have to be monitored every year, uh, particularly as you start to get older. We don't really like variable life policies being used um, for the fact that you invest your money in the market for your investments and your insurance should be guaranteed through, through some form of a, a guaranteed universal life or a whole life policy. Those are much better vehicles for you. So in other you words, stay about, away from them. Yeah, variable life, stay away. Um, so asset, pr asset protected, which is a big part of, of, uh, for physicians, uh, whole life makes a lot of sense there. And then if, if, you, if you're not making a lot of money yet, the term can bridge that gap, but you can convert that term to whole life over time. You know, one last point on that. Physicians accumulate their money in, in two main places, as we've been discussing uh, through the, this, these conferences. Uh, one is obviously their qualified retirement plans. The other big source of income for physicians is cash value life insurance because it's liquid you don't have to wait till 59 and a half. It's liquid and it's asset protected. They're the two main areas and private savings where they accumulate their wealth. Good, Jeff, sorry. Yeah, uh, hold on one second here. Do you have time for a question, guys? Yeah, we sure. do. The qu there was a question that came across about the disability insurance again. And I think there's just a, this uh, gentleman's particular um, case. At age 63, should he continue paying disability, continue paying on a disability insurance policy? I would because um, you're going to have a minimum, even, even if you, if it's a two age 65 policy and you become disabled, the day before you turn six, uh, six, uh, 65, the minimum payout in all the quality companies is 24 months. The, yeah, and, and also the older you get, to say the least, the statistics are um, that
that you're, that's when you're going to become disabled more so. But um, they have to pay out a minimum of 24 months. So you're going to get that. Yeah, I mean, if, if you can, a, dis, a, a long-term care policy would be a good alternative uh, at that age, if you can get it. To clarify, did you say if uh, you become disabled at, say, 64 and a half, um, they do not stop your payment at 65, they'll pay you to 24 64. months. 24 months from that time. Correct. Okay. At least every quality company I know, that's what they do. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, doctor. Okay, um, so we are going to uh, jump to, um, this is in session two, this is um, the sixth section, uh, which is investments, where we'll be ending with this chapter here. Uh, so uh, this is in the second chapter, the second session book, uh, section six, and we're going to start off with investments. Um, we're going to lead off with, you know, how to determine what investment mix is right for you and so on and so forth. Mike, you want to talk about um, a risk comfort questionnaire and, and how you yeah. try to determine your risk. How about if we just um, converse on what we say to someone when they, they come in and they say, oh, we want to invest and we want to do this. Uh, the most important thing that we need to know is um, what's your risk tolerance, okay? Now, you know, there's a, there are a few ways that, um, to ask this question, okay? And I'm gonna let you guys in on a secret because this is what I do when I start interviewing clients, trying to find out what their risk tolerance is, okay? I'll, I'll say to them this, Jeff, long-term, what type of risk taker do you think you wanna be? Very low, low, moderate, high, very high? And they'll pick one of them, okay? Oh, moderate, okay? And then we go and say, on a scale of one to nine, we ask the same question, by the way, in case you haven't figured it out, two or three different ways, the same type of questions. We'll say on a scale of one to nine, doctor, uh, when you make an investment, how concerned are you that you get that money back? A one meaning, oh, I don't really care. A nine meaning, oh, I want it all in cash under the bed at home or something like that. All right? And so, and then we say, you know, a nine uh, is like that. If you're in the middle, you're a four and a half. Oh, okay, are you four and a half? That's in the middle. You're leaning a little bit more risky or a little bit more um, towards conservative. That's the type of conversations we have with someone to determine their risk tolerance because that is so important in starting an investment program. Did that answer that for you, Jeff? Absolutely. You know, there's, there's something in your gut that tells you how much risk you're willing to take and trying to determine that can be a little bit of a challenge. So the questions that Mike were addressing kind of helps you go down that path to really, really understand if I, am I, how important is it for me to get my money back in an investment? If I lost 10 or 20%, how am I going to feel about that? And that really tries to help you know, get you to understand what is my real risk here that my gut tells me I can take. The other variables involved are time horizon, which is how long until I'm going to need those dollars? because you're really in two phases of your life. You're in accumulation phase. I'm saving dollars for retirement. I'm invested differently than I am when I retire and I switch to income distribution, which means you need a liquidation order, which is what assets am I gonna to, to tap into first, second, and third? That's a really challenging part of somebody's life because they're so used to working. They're so used to income coming in. Now that income stops and they have to figure out a way to get money out of these accounts and resemble a feeling of normalcy when you retire. So we set them up on a systematic distribution. You have money deposited every month. You feel normal. And we choose the assets to help, or you need to choose which assets. You never want to take money out in a down market. So you have a big cash bucket. You take money out of cash in early on in retirement. And your future growth assets are invested a little bit more aggressively. And in up markets, they feed, they feed that bucket that you're taking money from, your cash bucket. Okay, so... And Go ahead. And something paramount in risk tolerance and in proper planning, and we mentioned this uh, briefly last week, is that you never make a decision regarding asset allocation and or risk tolerance when something, a, 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 a calamity, something emotional is going on. The market goes up. That's not the time, folks. The market goes down. That's not the time. 
That's why you have to meet on a regular basis and update your plan and update your risk tolerance as though you've never met the person before and ask the same questions because, you know, we do change. Jeff had a great point. You know, um, the, the, the young physician, oh yeah, I'm, oh, I'm aggressive. I want to, I'm just, I don't think I'm big. But you be, then you mellow as you get on. But you do it slowly. You never make a decision emotionally. You sit down once a year or whatever, go over everything. And at that time, you give an objective viewpoint on what your risk tolerance is. It's so critical. So we talked about time horizon. That's how long you, until you're going to need to draw on those assets or how long you have to recover losses. A young person has a long time horizon. That's why they can be a little bit more aggressive because they get time to make it up. Whereas somebody in their 70s doesn't have that time to make it up. Therefore, they have a shorter time horizon. Therefore, they're going to be more conservative. Yeah, one of the, what you'll see is people that don't have a lot of money, like say let's, the newer doctors or newer people, they, they're, they want to be more risky. But once people have money, guess what? Their main goal isn't how much they're earning every year. They want growth at reasonable risk. But their main thing is when they have money, they want to keep it. The huge difference. And that happens at different ages. Yeah, 20% 20 20 loss on a couple hundred is a little bit different <laughs> than 20% loss on, on 10 million. So uh, yeah. you start to notice those big numbers as you start to amass uh, yep. larger amounts in your accounts. Uh, another consideration is where am I now versus where I should be. So you should be doing a portfolio analysis every year. I think one of the questions was, you know, what is my advisor adding to the equation? It should be analysis of where I am and where I should be and monitoring that portfolio every year. Uh, tax situation. Am I taking advantage of all my ta am I tax loss harvesting? Am I in, in tax efficient investments? Am I buying municipal bonds in my taxable investments so I'm creating tax-free interest? Uh, all that plays a role in the overall of how you build a portfolio um, for your account. So let's talk about if I want to invest money, uh, the two types, low ownership and ownership, how I actually buy uh, investments. Mike, you want to address um, loanership or loaning money? Yes. When anyone goes to start a business, they have to get money somewhere if they don't have it. They can either borrow it or bring in more partners. Basic. In investments, the basic things are loanership, which are bonds, okay, and ownership, which are stocks. If, because when you, are, when you uh, buy a bond, okay, you are loaning money to that company. Now they have to pay you back and they have to pay you interest while before they pay you back. Now the rate of return on there is gonna be a lot lower than possible returns on equities, but it's a safer investment. If the company goes bankrupt, guess who gets paid first? The bondholders. Guess who gets paid last? The stockholders. Loanership, safer, uh, lower risk, is one form. The other form is ownership. That is when you go in to a company and you buy stock and you become a partial owner in that company. So therefore, you have a more of a chance for higher growth if that company is successful. Also, higher risk. Okay, so you partake. Higher risk. There's a place for both. When the company goes bankrupt, who gets paid first? Oh, let's say this, this is stocks. Who gets paid last? The stockholders, okay? Ownership, loanership. That's what, a comp that's what companies are doing. That's what anyone does when they start a business. That's how they obtain their money. Loanership, bonds. Ownership, stocks. Yeah. Basic, more, that's basic. Yeah, more importantly, when I'm an investor, how do I invest money? And I do that in the form of ownership and ownership. So if I loan money to an entity, a corporation, a municipality, or the government, that's loanership. I'm giving them my money and they're paying me interest. Ownership, I'm buying stock in publicly traded companies. I uh, do that, which we're about to talk about. So loanership, I loan an entity my money. Ownership, I'm buying stock. Uh, loanership, let's talk about some options. A savings account is loanership. I'm giving the yeah. bank my money, they yeah. pay me interest. Usually they're making a little bit more money than, than what they're paying me and that's how they make their money, right? Um, CDs, same thing. I give them the money, they pay me interest. Um, bonds, um, 
I get, I did certain, did it, that, well, actually, Mike, you want to talk about the inverse relationship of bonds and interest rates? Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, when the market goes up, bonds go down. When the market goes down, bonds go up because the interest rate, they, you know, is going to be less, you know, when, uh, when the market is up than, and down when, than when it's up. It's everybody gets it mixed up as I'm, it sounds like I'm doing right now, right? <laughs> so but just remember this. Just remember this. The Dr. Cromer told me that if the market goes up, bonds go down. And if the market goes down, bonds go up. Yeah. There's well, paper. Yeah, let me, let me jump in here. Say, uh, right, doctor? Let, me, <laughs> let, me jump, let me jump in here. So as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So Right now, you know, the, the Fed just came out and said they're not going to be moving interest rates for the next couple of years. That's a good thing for bonds because if I have a bond that's paying 2% and they're issuing new bonds at 4%, I'm not going to get a good price for my bond. My bond price is going to go down because rates went up. So rates go up, my current bond prices go down, the value of my bonds go down. So we're in a very low interest rate environment. So you would think that interest rates are going to start to go up at some point. When they do, you really need to watch out for your bond portfolio because interest rates are going to push up, your prices are going to go down. Right. The inverse relationship there. So very important to understand. When you're analyzing your bonds, you have to look at the length of the, the bond maturities. Okay, so let's go back to bond basics. I buy a bond. I give the entity my money. Maybe it's 10 years. They pay me that interest for 10 years. And at the end of the 10 years, I get my money back. If I want to sell that bond before that 10 years, there's a market for bonds just like there is for stocks. The price I get depends on interest rates if they've gone up or down. Uh, that's the price I'm going to get. Intuitively, the longer the bond, okay, the higher the risk, the higher the interest rate. If you're concerned about rising interest rates and you keep the duration or the, the length of that bond short because you get a low rate, but you're not going to lose much on the downside pressure of interest rates rising. Okay, that's kind of bond management in a nutshell. So what do I need to look out for when I'm buying a bond or I'm buying a bond fund? The credit ratings. There's Moody's and S&P. They rate the likelihood that these bonds are actually going to pay you, right? Junk bonds are below investment grade. You see double B for Standard and Poor's and BA uh, for Moody's. That's somewhat speculative and they go all the way down. That's junk bonds, okay? So when you're buying bonds and you buy junk bonds, that, you're not really buying bonds. You're really correlated to the S&P, so you're still very aggressive. It's more like an equity. Investment grade bonds. Um, Municipal bonds pay, pay um, tax-free interest. So if it's not in an IRA or 401k, you buy the munis, you get high-rated investment-grade bonds, and, and you buy those. The, that's the way to do it, all right? So credit ratings and the length of those maturities play a role in your an analysis of a bond. So who issues bonds? Um, corporations issue bonds. In Mike's example of a corporation, they, want, they need to raise, raise capital. They do a bond offering. They issue those bonds. Uh, the retail investors like, like yourselves buy those bonds. The corporation gets the money to reinvest or whatever they want to do. And for that use of the money, they pay you the interest rate. Okay, that, that interest rate is taxable. Municipal bonds. Physicians love municipal bonds because they usually have high incomes and that interest is tax-free, right? Now, you wouldn't want to put your municipal bond in your Roth IRA, that's already tax-free. Yeah, we'll you want to buy this in your joint accounts, or your individually owned accounts, you buy the municipal bonds as part of your bond portfolio, investment grade, good quality munis, and that interest is now tax-free. Uh, if you're not using munis in your, in your taxable accounts, you need to reevaluate. Uh, you should have muni strategies inside there. Um, they work real well. And then you get U.S. Treasuries. Those are just government bonds. Lowest on the risk scale. You know, the government backing is, is everything, uh, but you get a low rate. Um, and then there's tips which are government bonds that go up by inflation, and then there's floating rates that float with interest rates. So in rising rate environments, you might want to use a floating rate, and in rising inf inflationary issues, uh, or scenarios, you want to use TIPS. All right, so that covers bond exposure. Mike, you want to talk about owning stock? Well, stocks are ownership in the company, as we've said probably 100 times. They're based <laughs> on supply and demand. So they're going up and down, but past performance is no guarantee of future return, but historically they have a much higher potential for, for investment growth. Okay. 
the types of stock funds, there, there's different types. There's types that, that specialize in producing income to people, okay? That means that in that portfolio, there's going to be a lot of companies that are paying hot dividends out. It's going to be a more established uh, uh, company where uh, they have strong dividends that they pay out to the people. The dividends are income. So it's a, it's a lower risk type of fund, uh, but it supplies income. Okay. Yeah, let, we're jumping ahead a little bit here, Mike. Let's, let's get it. We're going to get into the mutual funds and we'll talk about all those types. Uh, oh, okay. Let me just catch up. You kind of jumped ahead. Um, so how do I buy stocks? I buy them through indexes. Um, you got the S and P, which is a basket of 500 stocks. You've got the Dow Jones. Everyone knows the Dow Jones. Those are the 30 biggest stocks. How do you calculate what's, how, what's a stock's worth? You take the amount of shares outstanding by the stock price. That's called market capitalization. So the 500 biggest uh, is the S&P. The 30 biggest is the Dow Jones. You've got uh, the NASDAQ, which is all tech mostly technology. You got the Wilshire, which is 3,500 stocks. That's a big one. You got the Russell, which is a small cap. Most people use the S&P 500 as the benchmark, okay? So when I want to buy stocks, I look at what index are on and I, I trade it through my broker or an online brokerage. And that's how I get exposure. Mike talked about the different stock categories. A growth stock, Mike, you want to talk about growth stocks? Yeah, growth stocks are companies um, that all their profits that they're making, they're investing uh, back into their company for growth, to grow that company. So they're not paying much dividends, if any dividends at all. They're going to be riskier because they're uh, aiming towards uh, growth. The returns historically have been higher than uh, the growth in income. As I've started to say earlier, a growth in income type of stock, a stock that's going to provide growth is going to be riskier. A stock that's going to provide income means that their portfolio is going to have more established companies. Two growth, the two types of mutual funds, two stock types of stock funds, only one's more aggressive than the other. Uh, past performance is no guarantee, but the growth stocks will do better than uh, the growth in income and uh, they won't, but they won't be as stable. Good. Yeah, so we got growth, um, usually technology, biotech, um, comp industries that are rapidly growing and they they take those those profits. You know, you may even see a company that, that uh, has negative earnings because all their money is going back into research and development. You know, that's why growth intuitively, intrinsically is a little bit more volatile than income. You see income stocks, they've got a lot of cash on hand, they're in consumer staples, reliable income streams and they pay fat dividends that we like uh, and those dividends are taxed at a lower income interest rate. So uh, income stocks for somebody who's in a, in a retirement phase or a distribution phase make a lot of sense. Growth stocks make a lot of sense when you're in your accumulation phase. So um, there's one other thing that we talk about which is market capitalization. So when I'm analyzing a portfolio, the first tier is, is it a growth stock or an income stock? The next is market capitalization, 10 billion and up which I talked about shares outstanding by the price is market cap. That's the large companies. When you get into large companies, you're going to be a lot more st stability there because they're big. They usually been around for a long time. Then you go to, to mid cap, which is a little bit more aggressive. And then small cap, those are the smaller companies that haven't been around as long. So a little bit more risky. So growth versus income and then large, mid, small. That's the first analysis when you're analyzing stocks. Um, a stock split. You may heard this term a lot. People think that there's some perceived value in a stock split. There really isn't. There isn't. Um, all that happens is the, the, the share price goes down, but the, the, the amount of shares outstanding double. So all they do is a trick to try to get people to invest at a lower price. There's really no perceived value there. Yeah, um, stock split doesn't, doesn't mean that it's the making money. Yeah. Uh, do it yourself investing. Um, Mike, you want to briefly touch on that? Yeah. Um, you know what? It's fun, again, to some people, me included. It's fun uh, to, to buy some stocks and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as it's more of a play account for you, where it's not critical money to you, uh, that's fun to do that. But when it comes to serious money, the money that you're going to use during retirement to take care of you and your family, is that's money where you need to use the best minds in the world. And the best minds of the world are the professionals and manage money. The mutual funds are, are just are high-end uh, managed accounts. So there's nothing wrong with uh, having your own uh, stock account. Open an E-Trade, you know, have some fun, but your serious money, make sure you're working with the, 
professionals, the best minds in the world to do that. So when we talk about professional managed accounts or institutionally managed accounts, um, we talk about mutual funds. Um, you know, there's, there's passive managed and active managed. Uh, indexing, which is passive and active, you have a manager. So those are the first really two types of funds out there. You've got a, a uh, an active manager where it has a portfolio manager and a passive where there's no portfolio manager, it's, it's an index. If you're using an active manager, the expectations are they are outperforming the indexes by more than the fee that they're charging you for the active management. Okay, so good fund families, good selection there. Uh, you more really mean to make sure that they're outpacing the index. Otherwise, you just you would just index. So index is less expensive. Um, a lot of people are using active passive strategies where you're having a manager choose the index funds for you. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in the world of mutual funds, Mike, you want to address mutual funds real quick and comment on that? Um, yes. Do you mind what I um, refer to two doctors as, if, real quick? If you uh, don't don't do that yet, Mike. Don't do that yet. We got that. That's at the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, a huge thing in investments is asset allocation. Okay. When you buy a, a mutual fund, if you put a dollar into a mutual fund, you're not just buying one share of a company. That dollar, you may have, you'll be scattered in maybe 15, 20, maybe 100 different stocks. So it gives you instant liquidation, especially when you have uh, smaller amounts, put it in a mutual fund, so you have instant diversification, it lowers your risk and it, it, it increases your chance for a higher return. All right, that's what a mutual fund does. And the, the people managing them are, are the best minds in the world. So it's a great way, especially to start, or it's a great way if you want to grow your money and have it managed properly and not worry as much at night. Yeah. Mutual funds are very good. You know, the originally when stock market was invested, when it was developed, people would buy stocks. Well, then they wanted to diversify and they didn't have the money to buy three or 400 stocks or the ability to, to manage that. So the mutual fund was created to where you could pay, let's say $50 to buy one share. And now you own fractional shares of three or 400 different companies. And that's how the, why mutual funds became so popular, where you could systematically save into a mutual fund and start buying fractional shares of all these companies. And the managers would choose those companies that go inside there for you. That was the, the development of the mutual fund. And there's loaded mutual funds where you used to pay commissions and all that stuff. Those are gone. Uh, you're now paying fees and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay, so mutual funds, you got active versus passive. Um, strategies, and then instant diversification by buying one share. Now that brings me to what, how are these all calculated? When you buy a mutual fund, which is very unique, it's calculated at the end of the day in the form of what's called the NAV or the net asset value. So unlike a stock where you can put an order in and you get the price that it is at that second, um, a mutual fund you don't know until the end of the day, which is fine because your core allocation shouldn't be being day traded anyways. These are more buy and hold. So you're making judgments based on emotion, not on emotion, based on, you know, what's happening in your life um, as far as distribution or, um, or growth. So net asset value calculated at the end of the day, once a day, and that's it. All right. So if I put a sell order in, I get the price at the end of the day. I put a buy order in, I get the price at the end of the day. Uh, let's talk about categories. Uh, we talked about small, mid cap and large cap um, market cap. So there's small, small cap funds, mid cap funds, large cap funds, and then there's growth funds. Those are just invested in growth stocks. Growth stocks only, um, you're gonna be pretty aggressive because it's gonna be all, all growth stocks inside there. Then you've got value or income funds. Those are stocks, those are, those are funds that buy stocks that pay dividends, right? So less risky than a growth fund. You've got a dividend yield coming off that. So even if all the stocks didn't make any money, you're at least picking up the return of the dividend which a good portfolio might be in between three to 4% of dividend yield. So we love dividends, particularly in income producing portfolios. And then you've got index funds, low cost investing, where you're just buying the index. You can buy the S and P 500. You can buy the Russell. You can be by the Dow. There's no active management. You're just purely doing whatever the index does. Nice and easy. Um, hybrid. Want to talk about hybrid, Mike? Um, yeah, you can handle that. <laughs> okay. Uh, a hybrid fund, 
you've got growth in income. So inside, you, you may look at your 401k, for example, and say, you know, I'm approaching retirement. I'd like to get some stability in my fund, but I also want some growth. So you've got growth in income. You've got some growth stocks in there, and then you've also got some dividend paying stocks that are paying off a nice dividend that brings stability to the portfolio. So that's a hybrid, um, a fixed income. You've got a bunch of bonds and maybe a little preferred stock in a, in a fixed income portfolio in a, in a mutual fund uh, fixed income. Balanced, you've got some growth stocks in there and you've got some bonds in there. This is where you might be at a 60% stock, 40% bond allocation. That's a balanced fund. Um, then you've got bond funds. You've got corporate bond funds where they own all corporate bonds. Pretty easy. Um, government bond funds, they only own government bonds and municipal bond funds. So this is a good way that if you don't want to buy the individual bond, uh, you want a manager to do it for you, a mutual fund manager, where you could buy a municipal bond fund and now all the interest is, is tax free off of those bonds. So if I've got a portfolio that this is my money that has not already been taxed in my joint account with my spouse or my individual account, I'm gonna own municipal bond funds because they're paying tax free interest inside there. And that makes a lot more sense than uh, taxable bond funds. Uh, and then high yield, stay away from high yield. Uh, high yield is a direct correlation to the stock market. This is real aggressive stuff. So if you bought at a 60% stock and 40% bond allocation and you put high yield in there, it's like owning 100% stocks because the volatility for yourself. high yields is something you really got to watch out for. Um, next up, we got exchange traded funds. Uh, ETFs. Um, well, I talked about earlier how the mutual fund trades at the end of the day. An ETF was invented fairly recently, and this is a way that you can get really quick exposure to certain sectors. They've got ETFs for everything now. They've got gold ETFs, oil ETFs, um, index ETFs, and the difference there, though, is they, they trade at, like real time. So you can place a trade like a stock uh, on an ETF and get in and out of the market as quickly as you want if that's a value to you. Um, but that is the only real difference between a mutual fund and ETF is the, the way that it's traded. Um, and you can get real accurate. You know, you can buy like all gold or all oil if you really wanted to. Now this is really where the industry has gone, the individually managed account. This is the fee-based account. It says minimum of account size of 100,000. That's actually not the case anymore. This is usually around five to 10,000, you can get a fee-based account. And what does that cover? This is one set fee that covers the manager, all transactions. Okay, so this takes away, the commission world has ended and now it's what's called the fee-based world. Uh, this means that if you get a call from your advisor that you need to switch portfolios for whatever reason, okay? And you should, once again, you shouldn't be buying on a motion anyways, but you know for a fact that they're not making any more money, whether they make one trade or a hundred trades in this account. This is one set fee that you see come out quarterly. It covers all transactions. You know exactly what you're paying and it's transparent. And this takes away that concern in the back of your head is are they doing this for my best interest or their best interest? It doesn't matter in a fee-based account. It's all the same. Yeah, you have to be careful because you'll hear people advertising saying, oh, we don't, um, uh, you know, we don't charge commissions anymore. Or we don't charge uh, entry fees anymore. Well, you want to know something? Thanks to the Department of Labor, since 17, they scared the, the market enough where almost no one charges commissions anymore. Very, very rarely. Yeah, it's very all true. fee. It is, believe it or not, that's something good from the government uh, that came out because it, it leveled the playing field. No fee to get in, no fee to get out. And they make their money as if your profits go up. That it's an excellent, it's a great move that's happened in, since 16, 17. Yeah. So when we talk about fees, you know, I know that, that that's a big topic of conversation now. Um, managed accounts are really what everybody's using. The fees can range from two and a half down to under one. Um, a good fee is one and a half or under. And what does that mean? That that annual fee as a percentage of assets is coming out on a quarterly basis. So that you take the one and a half divided by four, and you see that come out quarterly. That puts the manager on the same side of the table as you, the client, because if their account goes down, they're getting a percentage of the assets. So they're getting paid less. If the account goes up, they're making more money because it's a percentage of the assets. 
So that fee-based world is really where you want to be. You really want to be in between one and one and a half all in. Uh, that covers the manager, fund expenses, and all transactions. Um, so where do I invest? Well, I want really high quality funds. I'm using a managed account. And what that managed account means is that somebody's choosing those funds inside of there. I'm getting one set fee that covers that sub fund selection, all the underlying fund expenses and all transactions. I want to systematically save on a monthly basis into these accounts based on my, my financial plan. My financial plan may say I need to save an extra $20,000 a year. Well, I'm going to have that done each month and those dollars are going to get put into there. Low cost, high quality stocks, high quality mutual funds in a fee-based account is really the way to go. That's really what people are doing out there uh, in the world. Yeah, so don't be fooled by people uh, throwing the commission words at you. Yeah, there's not really many, no many people charging commissions anymore. The days of, hey, buy this stock, sell that stock, and hitting you with a charge every time they do that. It's not right to do, and it's, it's, uh, it's really frowned upon in the industry at this point. Um, let's talk about annuities. Uh, another one that's got a lot of bad press. Um, we're just going to talk about, um, there are some good contracts out there, particularly for physicians. Mike, why do, why do physicians love annuities? Main reason for life, asset protection. Asset protection. Tax deferral. Yep, absolutely. You know, they, they can't take the, the, your annuity away from you. Uh, two different types, fixed and variable. Pretty basic. Um, Fixed means that you're getting a guaranteed interest rate. It's like a CD. Usually they pay a little higher than CDs um, because they're not backed by the FDIC. That's really the only reason. So these insurance companies pay a little bit more money. Uh, variable annuities, you're invested in the market. You take ownership of the risk. The account will go up and down based on market fluctuation. So that's what's called deferred annuities, which means most people think when they buy an annuity, that's a guaranteed income stream like a pension, but that's not really the case. This, in this contract, you get tax deferred growth, asset protection, and you're invested. You're either invested in the market or you're guaranteed. Now, there are annuities that act just like the pension. And we talked about pensions earlier, where you take a single life option or a joint survivor option. Um, that's if you annuitize a deferred annuity, or let's say you really want some guaranteed income that you can't outlive. Well, you go to the insurance company and you don't have a pension maybe, you wanna recreate a pension. You go to the insurance company and say, Here's my money, give me a guaranteed monthly payout. The amount will be based on the decision that you choose of how you wanna take that payment, whether you want it just based on your life or you've got a survivor, the age of both of you at the time that you take that out. Okay, so real quick on annuities, variable, fixed, those are deferred. At any point down the road, you can annuitize those and create guaranteed income. Let's say you didn't wanna defer that income and you wanted it now, you could do an immediate annuity Acts like a pension, you choose that, that selection, bang, you've got guaranteed income that you can't outlive. All right, that's annuity 101 in about a minute. <laughs> um, here we're gonna talk about just some basic common investment risks. Um, dollar cost averaging. Mike, pay yourself uh, first. Dollar cost averaging, a great place for someone to start if they're brand new starting. And um, a dollar cost averaging, let's say you, you put in um, $100 a week or $100 a month, you dollar cost average in, and it comes automatically from your account, you keep paying in the same amount. And if the, as the stock goes up, it looks real nice, but if the stock goes down, guess what? You're buying more shares at lower cost. The important thing about that is a dollar cost is in the average, which means that if the market goes down, you make out better than if the market goes up. That's one good thing, all those things. But the other thing is, it's a great way to start systematic savings. And dollar cost averaging is a form of protection for you if you continue that. Absolutely. Uh, you wanna talk about um, diversification and asset allocation. Here's yeah, so the uh, Nobel, Nobel story. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, people say, well, um, you know, what do I have to do? You know, what, what determines what my portfolio is going to do? Well, there's a Nobel Prize awarded to two doctors. Uh, excuse me, not MDs. They were two uh, professors at Northwestern University. And their whole, um, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded on this. When you have an overall investment portfolio, 
over 90%, 91.3 to be exact, is not, the rate of return is not determined by when they bought the stock or the bond or when they sold the stock or the bond or not even what the, uh, uh, the market's doing. 91% comes from the fact of asset allocation. Because, you know, guys, guys like us, we talk a good game like we really know what's going to happen in the market and this one's going to do better than that. We really don't know. You know what we know? We know that this year it might be large cap U.S. domestic stocks that are way up here and they might be down here next year. I mean, it could be internationals. The only thing we know is the, one, uh, the, the grouping that leads usually changes every year. Asset allocation is, is, is the cause of 91% of profit in portfolios. Jeff, please, let's talk about emerging markets and look at this graph that we use all the time. Yeah, it's funny here. You look at this chart, and this is a real common chart out there in the industry. If you look at 2010, uh, four down emerging markets, 2010, it was up 18%. In 2011, it was down 18%. In 2012, it was up 18%. In 2013, it was down 2%. It was down 2% in 14, down 14% in 15, up 11, up 37, down 14. So if that, if you try to chase returns, uh, that is not a good idea because as yeah, you can it see, doesn't work. things fluctuate and you don't have a crystal ball and you don't know. The, the, what asset allocation is based on is choosing good quality companies in your overall asset allocation. And you start off with how much do I have in fixed income and how much do I have in stocks? and make sure you rebalance that portfolio annually and keep that risk right you know, in line with what you, what the amount of risk you're willing to take on. And then you want diversification. You want a lot of assets that have nothing to do with each other. It's called negative correlation. You want some in large cap value, you want some in large cap growth. You want a little in mid cap value, a little bit of mid cap growth, a little bit in small cap value, a little bit of small cap growth, throw in some international, and then throw in some bonds, some corporates and munis, and build that portfolio, and that splits based on your risk. Modern and portfolio theory, period. Yeah, modern portfolio theory. And you hold that portfolio, you do maybe swap out some funds like to like if they're, if they're underperforming in their peer group, and that's the manager's decision, or if you're doing it yourself, that's your decision, which takes a lot of work to stay up to speed with all the changing markets. So that's why institutional managers play such a big role. They help you, help you with... The, the overall allocation and then what goes into that allocation is really what a good manager should be doing. Um, and they should be, if they're not indexing for you, which would be choosing index funds, which an advisor can do, it's called active passive management, which is where they're choosing indexes for you and actively managing it, or just active management where they're choosing all the funds in the, the lineup and they're, they're making moves as they seem necessary, but not big changes in that overall split of the 60-40 they might be just swapping out one manager for another uh, based on performance. And that, that happens at your annual review, uh, which you need to in, run, rerun your plan, which we're about to talk about. And then also rerun your portfolio analytics to make sure that you're in the best of breed in each asset class that you're trying to cover. You know? And that's really what it's all about. And doing that for, for less than one and a half percent was really the deal. Okay. Okay. Um, Which time? 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> pretty amazing okay so mike i'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing i'm gonna pull up the sample plan do we have any questions on that oh yes doctor oh. are there any questions there no, no new questions have come in good. okay well, that either means we're doing a really good job or everyone's asleep yeah. i'm not sure which one <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna share screen with you one more time here so. What we're going to do now, and we've been asked to do this, is you hear us, uh, we're very redundant about certain things, and uh, probably the main thing is the importance of having a, a plan, a financial plan, and reviewing it every year. So you, you've heard that so many times, and you're probably, well, what the heck is it? I'm not really sure what a financial plan is. So what we're going to do is we're just going to show you uh, quickly the sample, the type of financial plan uh, that we do with each and every client that we have. And then we review it every year as though we've never met them. Okay, this is, now you're gonna see a real financial plan. This is what one is, okay? So there's the famous John and Mary Smith. 
we start with this. Um, you know, we'll have clients come in and uh, we'll be going over uh, the plan and um, we'll say, okay, do you understand everything? Oh yeah, yeah, Mike, Jeff, we, we got it. Do you have any questions? Nope, we got it. And by the time they're walking to the elevators, you, we know they're going, what the heck did he mean by this? What the heck did he mean by that? So we write notes on things. Did you ever give a, um, a report or a chart to somebody and say, hey, do me a favor, would you take a look at this and write a note on there, you know, if you have any thoughts? Have you ever done that? Probably have. Do you ever get one back where the person's like written all over everything like that with all these notes? That's what Jeff and I do. And the reason is we don't have to prove to people how smart or how dumb we are. We just have to make sure they understand what's going on. So when you go through this, you're going to see handwritten notes on there so our clients understand it. So first question, hey, Mike, what do you have to do to become financially independent? You have to name five things, impossible. Uh, put them in order, impossible. This is how we would answer it. It doesn't mean Jeff and I are right, but this is how we think in wealth accumulation. Number one, emergency reserve. If you don't have an emergency reserve, you're going to be in trouble. Forget all the fancy day and investments. You have to have an emergency reserve first. Second, no matter how many letters Jeff and I have behind our name or how smart or how stupid we think we are, if we have a client with a subjective goal, accumulation goal, no matter what, we know we have to deal with that first, no matter what we think they should be doing. Third is obviously, we are about financial independence. We are very long-term. Um, that's what we do. Number four, probably with a little paranoia, um, disability we think is so important, uh, especially for physicians, and then needs at death, okay? So that's how we're thinking when we're writing notes. So the first thing we do is you just have the personal data. And by the way, this, these are actual clients. And then we put their advisors in, although we did cheat on this page a little bit, we just happened to put us and Bill McQueen and uh, <laughs> Jason on there, okay? But, um, and then we do, an asset summary, looking at this pie chart. This is the beginning. We just look at this asset allocation pie chart to make sure someone's diversified okay. Now we separate them into hard assets and good assets. Hard assets are not good assets thus because hard assets are things like your home, uh, automobiles, jewelry, things like that. It's all nice, but you can't uh, derive income from it. The other things are investable assets. So we look at that chart and they go, well, they, they're pretty even on their thing. We do a statement in net worth. If you remember last week, we told you the two most basic things in finance, CFP and CPA, are the statement in net worth, which means what do I have? Taking a picture in time, what do I owe and what's left over? And then we write a summary. I like this the summary and the, and the handwriting there. We do that every year to compare it with the year before. Because every year when we meet with our clients, we compare every year um, by the last year. All right, next, with, um, next, Jeff. Okay, emergency reserves we go into. This guy was okay, we can, we can go past that one. The cash flow statement we spend time on. We call this the infamous cash flow page because we'll say to someone, oh, doctor, um, how much money comes in um, a year? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, that much money comes in. And does uh, this much money come out because you gave us these numbers? Oh yeah, that's right, Mike. That's what came in, that's what came out. Okay, doctor, so then that means that you've got about 25,000 extra a month, right? Uh, not really. Because people on a statement in that work, excuse me, cash flow statement, they tend to uh, overestimate their income and underestimate their expenses, very common. These people were okay though. Well, so we do the statement net worth, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, what we recommend is people do the cash flow worksheet we talked about last week. Oh, yeah. if, oh God. If anybody wants that, uh, just email Elka and we'll email it over to you. Uh, that's really where we can help pinpoint what your expenses are, what your income coming in, and, and figure out how much left over we have each month, and then also what you're gonna need for retirement. Uh, extremely important exercise, and like I said, we can email that over to you. Yeah, that that is good. I told you I hate doing it every year, but I do it. Um, okay, and we do it. We do an income tax analysis. We use software for that. Your CPAs are going to have the exact numbers, not us on that. Then we we go over on you know your disability needs. Are you okay, these people are okay. We look at disability. Good, Jeff. Yeah, and on this one, we just talk about you know if we kind of like to like to put the real life situations there. You know, if if you became disabled. How much income would you need to come into the house? 
How much would you have from the working spouse? And is that enough to make sure that you look good from a disability perspective? And we do that for each party. Okay. Long-term care. Uh, Long-term care, once again, we analyze, uh, you know, if there's a need, actually these people had a need. And, um, and we, then we uh, discussed possible solutions. Go ahead, Jeff. Yep. Uh, education, these people had uh, children. Uh, so we, uh, we looked at that and uh, you'll see that they need to increase their savings a little bit. Go ahead, Jeff. And then we start, we get into um, retirement plan analysis. And if you want to stop on a summary timeline, thank you, Jeff. Yep, there we um, this is where we take uh, all the assets, the investments uh, that a client has. And the, and the way that we run this is, number one, we assume at, at this age, 55, they assume um, when they're going to stop working that they don't earn a cent. When we run these calculations, we give them a 5% rate of return, which is a very conservative rate. But the last thing we want is our doctors watching CNN, seeing you know, something going on in the market and worrying about retirement. That's why we're very conservative when we run this. And also, inflation over the past 28 years has averaged between 1.7 and 2.4% per year. We run our inflation at 3%. We, on purpose, we make it look worse because we don't want our doctors having, our clients having problems uh, at retirement. But that's what we do for every client. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, we shared this last week in the, in the presentation. Uh, if you're not, haven't had this done yet, this is something that you really need to have done. Um, this brings everything in together that we talked about in the retirement mm -hmm. planning piece. Yeah. Extremely important. And every year you review it as though you've never see, met each other before. That helps choose which way you take your social security, uh, when you retire, all those variables are involved in that. Yeah, Jeff, I want to spend just a moment here on the save more, earn more. Sure. Uh, to everyone uh, watching, here's where you're going to see the miracle of compound interest. It's, it's amazing. Here's a person that had, had a deficit, had to actually, they had to increase uh, the money they were putting away. So the clients will say to Jeff, or they'll say to me, hey, Mike, hey, Jeff, how much, how much do I have to put in so I can fund this plan and hit my goals? And we'll go, well, I don't know. What's your rate of return? Look at this one. Ignore the red one. That's a mixed bar. But the, and at 4.78%, they would have to put away $8,659 a month, okay? They hit the goal. Uh, at, if you go from 4.7 to 5.23, it drops all the way to 6,100. At 5.69, it drops down to 3,800. At 6.1, it drops down to 809. And if it's 6.59, they should hit their goals. The miracle of compound interest on, on tax deferred, tax deferred, compound interest, systematic saving is easy to answer. It's easy to answer with good habits. Go ahead, Jeff. We passed that. This goes over inflation. We already talked about that. Yeah, that's more in there for us. Uh, survivor needs this. We do an insurance analysis, life insurance, just the way of disability. We analyze all that. These clients were fine. Go ahead. This is kind of like if you die, what do you want to have happen? You want college paid for? How much income do you want created at your death? That's all this in that analysis. Very thorough. Okay. And then um, two things, that, um, and you've heard us uh, say this already. Uh, um, we're a, a pain in the neck. I think a good pain in the neck when it comes to making sure your wills and trusts are up to date. This is a will points checklist. Uh, these are pretty much the questions an attorney is going to ask you when you go in to have your wills done or, or when you go to review them, this is what you use. So this started out as 10 questions. We have different attorneys add, we've added and deleted, but that'll save you time and money because it'll, an embarrassment to answer these with your a spouse or significant other before you walk in there. That, that is uh, great. But the last one, we usually say we'd like to end our meetings with the, by depressing people a little bit. This is a, a guideline for a letter of final instruction. Um, remember, we do get the first phone call. You know, it's not the lawyer, not to speak, it's us. We're involved very often in deaths. And this is a letter that takes the burden off of your survivors and your family. It is not the time um, to, to have them make difficult decisions. This is very basic. It says, I wanna be, uh, I wanna be buried. No, I wanna be cremated. Um, no, I want a religious service. No, I don't want a religious service. I wanna have a get together. I don't wanna have a get together. 
I want to have alcohol. I know this sounds trivial. These are the questions that get asked. We want to have alcohol there. Uh, things like that. Basic things that have to be answered, not six or nine months later when you're going through probate, but immediately. This letter in, is very valuable. So please, if anything from, this, uh, from attending this course, please at least get a letter of final instruction and your wills and trusts are up to date. All right, the next page is... Uh, you know, that, that's another thing that if, if you want uh, emailed, uh, let Elkin know, we can provide you with that, with that final letter as well. Yeah, we will. And the will points checklist, just let us yeah, know. Cool. We'll shoot them out. Believe me, it's our service to help you with those two things. Then we just do a summary on uh, of the person's situation, the family situation. That's what that is. And then we make recommendations uh, to them. And that's what our, our plan uh, looks like. And um, there was one other element to it. it. Questions? Let me, uh, let me show one other last thing too. Um, oh, do, uh, do you have the um, portfolio overview? Yeah, that's what I'm trying yeah, to Yeah, that's what I, show them that because the, uh, this is yeah, a so report that we do. You know, oh, we, talked about, you know, you we talked about overall asset allocation and oftentimes you've got maybe two or three, four different accounts and you've never looked at them all together. So uh, part of the plan is that we take a look at every account individually and then we aggregate them all together to make sure that you're balanced for the right risk profile that you feel as though is, is, is appropriate for yourself. So as you can see, it breaks down how much cash, how much U.S. stock, how much international, and what's your bond exposure. Uh, is it large cap, mid cap, small cap, value versus growth. That's in the equities. In the bond side, what's the duration of your bonds? What's the credit quality? Make sure you're not holding a lot of junk bonds. It goes over your, your historical performance. The best and worst, three month, one year, three years of your portfolio. It covers the yield. It covers fees. It covers uh, international breakdown. It covers sector breakdown. Pretty much it covers stock overlap to make sure you're not owning one individual stock too heavily. So a very, very, very deep dive into what you own. And then we give you individual reports on each individual holding that you have. Uh, that's all part of the plan um, that we're offering to you guys as well. So um, yeah, you could bring just that report into the physician's lounge and uh, you'd have a hundred more friends uh, <laughs> in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, Mike, you want to talk about the, what we've done for, with the association and, and um, a little bit on that? Uh, yes. I um, alluded to this uh, earlier. Uh, you know, since we've been associated, uh, HCMA has asked us to, um, well, they, their doctors come first, and you guys know that by now. And by the way, we deal with medical associations all over the country. I say this, this is the truth. HCMA is excellent. It's the best run uh, local uh, hospital uh, association that I've seen, and we deal all over the country. So that's a benefit. And one of the things that they ask us to do, just as they ask us to offer the discount uh, to those members, and I think we discounted the from fifteen hundred to five hundred, and then um, then they uh, they said let's uh, do uh, something even more for these people on here, and we will do. Um, we decided to, uh, tonight uh, speaking with them before everybody else got on that we the people uh, uh, that are in this uh, conference in these classes will actually uh, we're going to waive the fee for you completely, and. Um, I'll tell you, it's pretty cool. Gathering information, maybe a little bit of but it is really neat. I'll tell you. you know, yeah, take that with a grain of salt. I love this. And Jeff's. Uh, we'll do the full, it's, the it's full, great. full portfolio analysis and a full plan. Yeah. Um, if, if that's something that you would like, uh, the, I see somebody popped up. What exactly are we waiving the fee for? Our usual fee to do a full comprehensive financial plan and portfolio analysis is $1,500. And that doesn't involve any investment management or anything like that. West and by the way, that's cheap compared. Yeah, to, that was brought down to $500 for any member. Uh, for anybody who signed up tonight, uh, that fee is waived. So I hope that answered that question. Uh, yes. It's a full, thorough analysis of everything that you have, um, hitting all your objectives, and make sure everything's covered. Um, and if you want to do that, uh, you can reply to Alka and just let her know. She's going to send an, an email out tomorrow with all our contact information. But if you want to reply to that email, uh, our office will reach out to you and schedule something and get you on the books. We can do it through Zoom. We can do it in person. Uh, we've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings, so um, that's been working real well. 
so nobody has to come in if you don't feel comfortable. Uh, we can do it right through Zoom and do the, the process is a fact finder where we get to know you and your situation. And then we take that data and we build the plan and then we do the plan presentation. And then oftentimes we'll, we'll cover those recommendations there, but sometimes it's another meeting to talk about some more stuff or sometimes we just wrap it up in two. So um, depending Wait, on the class. And we are starting to see people back in the office again. And guess who's leading the parade coming back in the office? The pulmonologist. Or <laughs> the guy's in critical care, right? And they're the ones, oh, I want to come back in. I want to come in. <laughs> They've already been exposed to everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the truth. <laughs> Do we have any questions? we got a couple more minutes. Nothing uh, new is popping up. Okay, good. Okay. So I just want to reiterate that uh, if any of these, the attendees are asking for copies of documents uh, or, or to get a hold of you for any questions that they didn't think of or didn't have the time to put in tonight, yeah. they, can, they can contact your guys directly, right? Through, yeah. the, through the information that Elka will send everybody tomorrow. And yeah. part of my file, I got a sheet that looked like this that has your contact information. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, we, there's, there's contact information for Mike and my, uh, myself inside the folder that we provided. Oh, yeah, that's uh, right. And uh, Elk is going to provide a, an email tomorrow. Awesome. Uh, if you want to, if you want to reach out to the, to the CPA or the attorney, just send us an email and we'll put you in touch with them as well. We right. don't want to give you all these names and confuse you. Yeah, and another thing. Um, we're easy to contact. Our cell phones are on 24 seven, but believe me, I know I've had guys on call and call me at two o'clock just to say, Hey Mike, are you really to keep your phone on all night? <laughs> the answer is that's, they're not true stories. And, but the, and the answer is yes, we do. Cause we get all the calls, but uh, you know, some of these questions are, are personal and people just want to ask us a personal question. Yeah. So we're on all the time. And if anybody has any questions going down the road, whether you decide to, to take advantage of the plan or not, Give us a call. We're more than happy to. And we're here for you guys. And uh, so, if anything that comes up, we're a resource. So, feel free to hammer us with questions anytime you want. Yeah, and then you know, whether you become a client or not has nothing to do with this. We'll help you any way that we possibly can. Right. Right. Well, what a great partnership uh, you guys have made with the HCMA. Thank you for all of your expertise and time. The message is now coming in that every people who are watching this greatly want to thank you. Uh, thank you for putting your time and the effort, the great talks, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we do have a feedback questionnaire in this um, brochure also. So fill that out and fax it back to um, the HCMA, and we'll make sure that um, we uh, compile the information on this evaluation form and get it back to Mike and Jeff. One yeah, last that's, thing, an important, that's an important thing that we do need that. Yeah, yeah we always change the curriculum yeah. and stuff like that. One yeah. other thing is just be on the lookout. Uh, We'll probably won't be doing anything until the beginning of the year, but uh, we intend to start doing maybe three or four of these on different topics um, each year and maybe shortening it down, maybe just a, an hour segment. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll probably be teaching isolated um, webinars on certain topics over the next year or so. Yeah, for example, with uh, what we do with a lot of the residents, well, the fellows especially, is that we'll center on a certain topic um, on something and then we'll bring in another expert, a, a high-end uh, attorney or, or something like that to address that topic. And um, they're, they're, people like them they're, and they're not as long, they're a little bit more casual, but you get people that are really smart and you get to uh, talk to them and answer, their, and they answer your questions. It's pretty neat also. Okay. okay. All right, thank you, Mike and Jeff. Have, everyone have a good evening.